And if everyone could please find seats, we're going to begin. We are quiet in the chambers, please. Thank you. Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's 10th day of hearings on the Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined today by the Committee on Education, chaired by Councilmember Traeger. We've also been joined by Councilmember Brad Lander, Antonio Ro Reynoso, Barry Grudenchik, and um, Justin Brannan, and I think that's it, okay? I'm sure others will be coming. Today we will hear from the Department of Education, the School Construction Authority, and the Economic Development Corporation. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKinney, Committee Councils Rebecca Chasen and Stephanie Ruiz, Deputy Directors Regina Porreta Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads Doheny Sampora and Curlian Francisco, Financial Analyst Caitlin O'Hagan, Chelsea Baytamore, and Aliyah Ali, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at finance to finance testimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority. I'm going to briefly flag several areas of real concern. First, the council is troubled that, the only, that only one of our requests in the preliminary budget response is funded in the executive budget. We are relieved to finally see the DOE Students and Shelter Program baselined at $11.9 million. And we appreciate that the administration has agreed to fund the additional $2 million the council provided this year for bridging the gap social workers in fiscal 2020. However, the council had other significant education priorities, including providing pay parity for early childhood educators, hiring additional social workers, and making greater investments in LGBTQ curriculum supports. None of these priorities are funded in the executive budget. As a former director of an early childhood education center, I am particularly troubled by the administration's unwillingness to address the pay parity issue for these essential staff supporting our children's youngest learners. Second, we're concerned by serious risks in DOE's budget. While the executive budget does add funding su to support rising Carter case costs, it is unclear if additional investments will be needed. And it is also unclear whether expanded special education programs in DOE district schools will ultimately lead to reduced spending on these settlements because the students currently turning to private schools will be able to be accommodated in the public school system. In addition, the executive financial plan doesn't make any adjustments to the fiscal 2020 or out year budget for pupil transportation. This is true, even though we know the cost of these contracts has risen and additional funding will be needed to provide GPS on all school buses by September 2019, as required by recently enacted local law. Finally, we remain concerned that DOE's budget does not accurately, accurately reflect the cost of its contract with New York City School Support Services, the nonprofit that provides custodial staff in schools. Third, the council remains dissatisfied with the presentation of the fiscal 20 to 24 year, five year capital plan. Since we have already had two hearings to discuss this proposed plan, I will not belabor these points of concern and hope that we can continue a productive dialogue with DOE and SCA to address our request. I am pleased to report that SCA has agreed to include identified K-12 seat need in every subsequent amendment of the fiscal 20 to 24 five year capital plan. However, one area of real alarm remains the lack of transparent methodology for funding pre-K and now also 3K seats. 
after investing $872 million in the current plan on building pre-K seats, we are now hearing that these centers sit underutilized and are siphoning, siphoning students from long-standing nearby CBO providers. The proposed fiscal 20 to 24 plan allocates $550 million to, to pre-K and 3K seats with no breakdown of where these seats will be constructed or even how many seats will be constructed. The executive capital commitment plan reflects an increase of $15.5 million th for 3K seats in District 8, again without any explanation of how this funding need was determined or how many seats will result from this investment. The city's unwillingness to address pay parity and the lack of transparency in funding the construction of pre-K and 3K spaces are both threatening the stability of the contracted early childhood care system. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Council Member Mark Traeger, for his statement, and then we will hear from DOE Chancellor Richard Carranza and School Construction Authority President Lorraine Grillo. But I did just want to take a moment also to welcome the students from MS50 who were here today and were out on the steps protesting to keep their middle school quality initiative program and their debate team going. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum. Good morning. I am Councilmember Mark Traeger and Chair of the Education Committee. Welcome to the Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget Hearing on the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority. The Department of Education's Fiscal 2020 Budget of $27.1 billion is $218 million more than the prelim budget. This includes $350 million in new needs for Fiscal 2020, offset by savings and other adjustments. However, this is a deeply disappointing and unacceptable education budget for the council, particularly from a mayor who ran on a promise of schools, not jails. As Chair Drum mentioned, rather than new programs or services, the majority of new needs funded in the DOE's executive budget are in fact mandated areas of spending that the council identified as budget risks. I think it's worth noting that one of the risks areas is spending on charter schools, which will total $2.3 billion in fiscal year 2020. In terms of the council's response, we saw almost no items funded in the executive budget, except for a baselining of the students in shelter program that was frankly long overdue, and also frankly, we need a lot more social workers for. I've been a fierce advocate for increases to fair student funding, or FSF. And I am deeply disappointed that the state did not provide additional funding the city is owed that would have allowed us to raise the FSF floor. However, I am also disappointed that the city did not step up to fill this gap in school budgets. FSF is a flexible funding source, and not increasing FSF can have, and will have, detrimental impacts. Newly hired staff may be accessed. Let me give an example. If you were a new special education teacher hired to better meet the needs of your students, you are most likely going to be accessed if we don't increase your school budget. If you were one of the few social workers that were hired in the last year, you might be accessed if we don't increase these school budgets. I'm even more frustrated that DOE did not make dedicated investments in social emotional supports. How was DOE able to find $20 million to support borough office staff for the comprehensive school support strategy, but unable to find resources that could support staff in schools who provide direct services? Let me again highlight that in a district, in a district with 1.1 million children, we have only 2,958 guidance counselors and 1,335 social workers. We desperately need more social and emotional supports, but there is currently a baseless hiring freeze on social workers and guidance counselors. We also have only one Title IX coordinator, which is why the council called for seven additional coordinators to be hired. Another council budget response item missing from the executive budget. After our hearing on Title IX last month, 
I'm not sure if all senior staff at DOE even know what Title IX is. I also want to point out that the School Diversity Advisory Group issued a powerful set of recommendations in February of 2019 on how to better address integration efforts in our New York City school system. I'm mindful that the mayor and the chancellor have been meeting and speaking with members of the group, but it's worth pointing out that not one dime is allocated in the executive budget to actualize the recommendations from the School Diversity Advisory Group. At prelim, DOE was given a peg target of $104 million. While the department did exceed its peg target, including savings the council called for, such as reducing non-pedagogical staff in the central and borough offices, some of the proposed savings are of concern to the council. We want to better understand why DOE is baselining $6 million in savings from the Breakfast in the Classroom program. What are the challenges to implementation? No child should ever go hungry in our city, and cutting breakfast in the classroom will exacerbate food insecurity. Most of our children qualify for free lunch. There is a real need. And if there are issues to the program, you don't drop the program, you address the issues to the program. That's a complete cop-out. Another incredible, incredibly concerning cut is the $19 million reduction in support for extended learning time at renewal and rise schools. Over the past year, we heard repeated assurances that the resources provided to these schools would not be reduced. Now we are seeing the opposite. We cannot break our promises to these schools, and we must ensure they are given the resources they need to continue to succeed. And let me again just remind folks here, these were schools that were given additional resources because they were shortchanged in the first place, more ways than one. And if the resources were turning things around and we were seeing progress and children were, were benefiting both, both in terms of academic and social, social emotionally, you don't cut that, especially when you're sitting on a $500 million surplus that OMB just acknowledged recently. You don't cut that. You don't break a promise to kids, and you don't cut vital funding for, for, for our children. It's unacceptable. There's also another issue that needs immediate attention, as the chair pointed out. We need salary parity for early childhood educators and directors. Teachers that have the same qualifications, whether they work in DOE or at a CBO, should make the same. These educators work very hard with some of our youngest and most vulnerable students. We must address this parity issue once and for all. And I just have to say this again. The mayor's signature UPK program is on the brink of collapse. I have met with a number, significant number of providers across the five boroughs. They are in huge distress. They cannot retain educators. They keep losing staff. That means children during the, the, the formative years of their lives are seeing new staff turnover frequently over and over and over again. The educators are predominantly women of color who have the same qualifications as their DOE counterparts, work longer days and more days of the year, but yet are grossly underpaid. It's unacceptable. And I just want to also echo the, chair, uh, the chair's thanks to the outstanding finance division and the city council for their incredible work in preparing for this hearing. I want to also thank the Education Committee staff, Malcolm Buterhorn, Jan Atwell, Kalima Johnson, and I want to thank my staff as well, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and I will turn now back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. We have been joined by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, Councilmember Levine, and Councilmember Gibson. And with that, I'm going to ask Council to swear the panel in and then you can present your um, testimony. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. You can begin. Oh. Yep. <laughs> I was waiting for an introduction, sorry. <laughs> So good morning, Chairs Drum and Traeger and members of the Finance and Education Committees that are here today. 
My name is Richard Carranza and I have the honor of being the New York City Schools Chancellor. Joining me this morning are Lindsay Oates, our Chief Financial Officer for the New York City Department of Education, Lorraine Grillo, who is President and CEO of the New York City School Construction Authority, and Karen Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor for School Planning and Development, uh, also with the Department of Education. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on Mayor de Blasio's fiscal year 2020 executive budget as it relates to the Department of Education. Nearly a year ago, I appeared before you to testify about the budget as the newly minted chancellor with only eight weeks under his belt. Over the past year, I've been laser focused on disrupting the entrenched systems that have kept underserved students from achieving their potential on acknowledging that some students need more support than others and providing that support. My goal today and every day that I am chancellor is to advance equity now. Only an equity approach can ensure that all of our students have the opportunity to receive the education, life skills, and social capital that opens doors to success. And I would like to thank the council for your dedication to the children of our city through your advocacy, generous funding, and partnership with the Department of Education. I'm pleased to report that the mayor's fiscal 2020 budget, executive budget continues this administration's investments to advance equity throughout our system and ensure our students have the tools that they need to succeed. Through our equity and excellence for all agenda, we have cumulatively made $4 billion in new education investments in our schools. I wanna take a moment to highlight some of our equity and excellence for all initiatives that are raising the bar for our students across the city. Just two weeks ago, 65,521 families received an offer for free full day, high quality pre-K for all. And we are building on this investment in early education with the expansion of 3K for all. Our focus on equity brought computer science for all to a record 134,000 students last school year. These students are writing code, building physical prototypes and engaging in mobile app design and more. Thanks to this investment, we have seen a fourfold increase in the number of students taking and passing an advanced placement computer science exam since 2016. The increases are even higher for female, black, and Latino students. For example, the number of female students alone passing an AP computer science exam has increased sevenfold. I would like to thank the council for hosting this year's Computer Science for All Hack League, where students use computer science concepts to solve real world problems that impact their communities in this story chamber and elevating the work of our young computer scientists. Who knows, the next Steve Jobs may be sitting in one of our classrooms right now, poised to create tomorrow's big technology breakthroughs. But make no mistake, these are the types of opportunities that advancing equity and changing lives can have an impact on our students. Our College Access for All initiative is one way we are closing the gaps in low, com low income students and students of color enrolling in college. This school year, every student in middle school has the opportunity to visit a college campus. Our high schools are equipped with the resources for seniors to graduate with a college or career plan. And through this initiative, we've removed barriers to higher education by eliminating the CUNY college application fee for low income students and making SAT available for free of charge during the school day for all high school juniors. We now have a record high college enrollment rate of 59%, but our goal isn't only to provide students a pathway to college and career success. We also have a duty to give them the skills to become active participants in our democracy. Through Civics for All, we are ensuring that our students will become the next generation of leaders that our country and our city so desperately needs. I absolutely loved participating in our first ever Civics Week last month and observing our young people in action. We had students proposing projects that would benefit their communities through participatory budgeting, engaging in speaking competitions on issues affecting their communities, and participating in school-wide town halls. Students even got to engage with guest speakers like Chair Traeger, for example, who shared his experiences as a city leader and as a teacher. These are just a few of the ways in which we are advancing equity now and empowering our students and families. Our equity and excellence for all agenda also includes investments in the arts, physical education, career and technical education, and much more. And these investments are putting us on a path to reach or surpass our goal of 80% graduation rate by 2026. We have the highest graduation rate on record at 76% with increases in every borough and amongst every demographic group. 
We, we have the all-time lowest high school dropout rate at 7.5%. And for a third year in a row, our students have outperformed students on the state, across the state, on the English language arts exam, and our students are continuing to close the gap with the state on the math exam. More students than ever before are taking and passing AP exams. So the bottom line, because of our equity and excellence for all agenda, our schools are the strongest they have ever been and continue to serve as models for school systems across the country. To build upon these gains, we have answered the call for more responsive and streamlined school support and leadership structures. We've created clear lines of accountability and brought resources closer to the classroom under the direction of our executive superintendents. As part of our structure, I also created a division of community empowerment, partnerships, and communications, which is leading the way to empower families and communities to move their schools forward. We are working more closely with community-based organizations and leaders to advance, inform, and support educational equity and progress across our city. The division is also home to our newly hired student voice manager, who is spearheading efforts to bring the priorities and concerns of students to policy and decision making, creating real change in the Department of Education. I also created the new division of school climate and wellness, which is centering the needs of the whole child by offering social emotional support, implementing restorative practices, and explaining how we approach school discipline in order to reduce racial disparities. As part of this work, we invested $23 million to provide anti-bias and culturally responsive training for all school staff, $47 million annually to support schools with critical resources to strengthen their culture and climate, and $8 million in anti-bullying initiatives. We are also continuing our work to support our LGBTQ students, families, and staff through staff training, inclusive policies, and other key efforts, including the development of curriculum. All this work is essential to ensuring our schools are safe spaces for children and adults to share the truest version of themselves. We are seeing results. For example, suspensions for the first part of this school year are down 14% when compared to the same time frame last school year, and average suspension lengths are down 30%. In addition to changing the DOE's organizational structure, we are moving our system forward with a citywide equity-driven approach to supporting all schools in place of a binary approach. This new framework, which we are calling the Comprehensive School Support, is not a program or a designation. It is a strategy for identifying needs and delivering support to all schools, using the DOE's new streamlined structure and implementing a new system of collecting real-time data. The recently launched Bronx Collaborative School Model, known as the Bronx Plan, is an example of the tailored support that CC CSS allows. The Bronx Plan directs resources to address the specific needs of historically underserved schools across our city, including additional salary for teachers in certain critical positions. These schools will also take on a collaborative decision-making approach to move their communities forward. I'm excited that the work is already underway in 60 of our schools, and I'm hearing tremendous enthusiasm from educators about the plan and how schools are using it to better serve their students. Of course, as we speak about how we advance equity now and serve our students, I must mention <clears throat> our efforts to address segregation and integrate our classrooms. It was my honor to testify in front of the City Council earlier this month, the same month at the 60, of the 65th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education on this very important topic. It was also my honor just last week to meet with both School Diversity Advisory Group and Teens Take Charge about their recommendations for how we can move forward the critical work of integrating our schools. The bold steps that we're taking to ensure our schools reflect the rich diversity of our city and the bold steps we will take will be an essential part of all of our work ahead. I would be happy to further discuss school segregation and integration today or to meet at any point with council members on that topic. But just as we are optimistic about our equity agenda and the future of our school system and the children it serves, we are confronted by a very troubling fiscal reality. A difficult economic climate, fiscal pressure from Albany, and uncertainty from Washington, D.C., all shaped this year's budget. Like other city agencies, we were tasked with finding savings to help close the city's budget gap. We sought to minimize the impact of school budgets, yet had to make some very hard choices. Our savings initiatives included tens of millions of dollars in administrative savings through a central hiring freeze, 
finding efficiencies in procurement and improving revenue claiming. We also had to eliminate the renewal hour earlier than originally planned and are working with school leaders to identify other available extended learning opportunities. The mayor's executive budget for the Department of Education is approximately $33.9 billion for the fiscal year 2020. And DOE's funding is comprised of city, state, and federal resources with city tax levy making up the largest portion. Our funding is approximately 57% city tax levy dollars and 36% state dollars with only 6% federal dollars. This executive budget includes new targeted investments to help us advance our equity and excellence for all agenda. This will bring 3K for all to two additional districts next year, bringing the citywide total to 14 districts by September of 2020. As part of the DOE's reorganization, I created the position of Chief Academic Officer to ensure comprehensive instructional supports are in place for all learners, including students with disabilities. The budget continues this administration's commitment to meeting the needs of our students with disabilities by providing an additional $33 million in new resources dedicated to special education. These resources will support pilot programs for students with autism and print-based disabilities and allow us to hire more clinicians to improve the timeliness and quality of individual education plans. The executive budget also baselines $11.9 million in initiatives targeted towards students in temporary housing, including our Bridging the Gap program that brings social workers to the elementary schools, serving those students and our after-school reading clubs in the DHS shelters. It also includes funding for the CSS approach that I mentioned earlier. The executive plan continues this administration's substantial investments in the fair student funding formula, and to date more than 800 million has been dedicated to raising the FSF floor. As the council knows well, when this administration started, the FSF floor was 81%, and the average school had an FSF level of 87%. Thanks to this administration's investments and help from the council, the FSF floor is now at 90%, and the system-wide average is 93%. We know that we must do more to guarantee that every school in the city has the resources it needs to put each and every student on the path to success. However, the city cannot do this alone. I, like you, was disappointed that for yet another year the Senate has left the promise of the campaign for fiscal equity, equity unfulfilled, shortchanging our students by $1.1 billion in fiscal year 2020. I cannot thank the council enough for your staunch advocacy in Albany to get the funds from the state that our students need and more importantly are owed. I know you are in this fight for the long haul and believe that the FSF task force that was created by council member Traeger's legislation will yet again demonstrate to the state that our commitment to equity directly translates to how we fund our schools. From free full day high quality pre-K for all to the soaring number of students taking and passing computer science exams to steady gains on state exams, to the highest high school graduation rates on record, we have a great deal to be proud of, yet we know we have much more work to do. So thanks to the talented educators and leadership from the mayor and partnership with the city council, I am confident that together we will make even faster progress in enabling all of our students to reach their full potential. I wanna thank you for your time and that, with that, I would like to turn it over to President Lorraine Grillo, who will discuss the proposed five-year capital plan. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Chairs Traeger and Drum. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. I will be very brief and go through the capital plan as it's proposed. The highlights of this plan include $8 billion for nearly 58,000 new seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding. $750 million to make 50% of elementary school buildings partially or fully accessible, and one-third of all buildings fully accessible. $284 million for the electrical work to support air conditioning in all classrooms by 2021, advancing that program by one year. $565.5 million in support of the 3K and Pre-K for All initiative, and $750 million for technology enhancements. Our capacity program is scheduled for a total of $8.9 billion, capital investments at $5.7 billion, and mandated programs at $3.5 billion. 
That's a total of $18.1 billion. Capacity includes several categories. New capacity, that's new seats, is $8.02 billion. 3K and pre-K early education is $565 million. Class size reduction is $150 million. And capacity needed to remove some t uh, transportable classrooms is $180 million. Under new capacity, we're proposing funding for 57,965 seats. And in, that includes an estimated 91 school buildings. 86 are PS and IS buildings. Uh, there has been a slight addition to this, and that includes District um, 30 in Queens, which will be Parcel C, uh, a, new, a new parcel in uh, Long Island City and Court Square, a school added to that area. Um, and in addition, there will be five ISHS schools in Queens for over 8,000 seats. Uh, there is a breakout available to you for all the districts and the seat need within those districts. Then there's the capital improvement section, which is $5.7 billion includes $3.01 billion for capital improvement programs. That's our building systems. That includes $2.86 billion, and it really deals with those buildings most in need of repair. It includes upgrades to life safety systems, such as fire alarms and public address systems. Also, site improvements. Then the removal of transportable classroom units, which I know has been um, a real priority for the council, includes $50 million, which will remove 34 non-capacity dependent transportable classrooms, and another $100 million for athletic field upgrades. Again, the list of those TCUs that we have removed, which is up to 205, and another 75 that are in the process of being removed, which reduces the number of remaining units to 74. Included in capital investments is also what we call school enhancements, which is $2.43 billion, including facility restructuring for things like school-based health centers and the like. Air conditioning initiative, which is $284 million. Our gym initiative, safety and security, science labs, accessibility, physical fitness upgrades, bathroom upgrades and technology. And finally, our mandated programs. Those categories include building uh, boiler conversions, asbestos remediation, code compliance initiative, our wrap-up insurance, and prior plan completion costs. That number has increased because projects have begun late in this plan, and that has increased that number. And then, of course, we have our great photos of our new projects, and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, and uh, let me start off by um, thanking you, um, uh, although we're gonna have some tough questions for you, Mr. Chancellor, but uh, on your commitment and your courage to uh, integrate our school system um, and uh, to ensure that uh, Culturally responsive education is taught, and uh, your work on, um, on implicit racism and your support for LGBT students. It's really wonderful to have uh, you working on those issues here. It's been a long time coming, and we are very grateful for the work that you're doing there. Thank you. Um, let me talk a little bit about some of the budget risks. The DOE recently renegotiated pupil transportation contracts covering 60% of routes at a total cost of $5 billion over five years or $1 billion annually. If the contracts covering the remaining 40% of routes are extended or awarded at similar costs, the total annual cost of pupil transportation will be $1.67 billion. However, the current budget for pupil transportation in fiscal 2020 is only $1.25 billion. Why is the DOE's budget still underfunded by hundreds of millions of dollars for pupil transportation? So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna ask our Chief Financial Officer, Lindsay Oates, if she could give you a little more detail on that particular question. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, so we have a variety of different initiatives going on with our um, Office of People's Transportation and our busing cro contracts in uh, specifically. Uh, as you're aware, we have um, several other open contracts, a bid on the street, as well as a GPS bid on the street. And so I think that um, we are sharing, OMB is very well aware of the, um, the needs associated with busing. However, we think that there are a variety of ups and downs that may come from the bids that are currently out there. And so we will, we will see and, and continue to talk with OMB about this in the coming months. Do you think that it will be in there before, um, before we close? I really can't speak to OMB's decision-making process on that, but I think that, again, we're sharing um, with OMB the updates. They're involved in all of these conversations, and um, I think there will be more to come. Okay, thank you. The latest state memo on special education pre-K says New York City needs 550 preschool special class seats. We understand that since the release of that memo, the DOE opened 21 new classes, providing 176 new seats. However, at least two CBOs, Sheltering Arms and AMAC, are closing their preschool special classes at the end of June, leading to a loss of at least 112 seats. As part of the executive budget investment in special education, the DOE expects to open 526 new special education pre-K seats. How much of the $81.4 million special education investment is for special education pre-K seats? So again, Chair, I'm going to ask our uh, Chief Financial Officer to answer some of the details. I think there is a perfect storm that is happening as well. And as we've been working with our community-based organizations and community-based uh, pre-K centers, the funding that the state provides is actually decreasing, which is making it very difficult for our, our CBO partners to keep their doors open. That's happening at the same time that we're having different uh, enrollment trends that are happening. So. There, there is a number of things that are happening, uh, but I'm going to ask uh, CFO Oates if she can give you some more detail on your question. Thank you, Chair Drum. So uh, as you acknowledge, we have opened a significant number of new pre-K special education seats over the last couple of months. Um, we did so in September, January, and again in April. Um, we plan to open additional classes this fall. Um, the our funding source is partially coming from state reimbursement. Um, the state has a provision in the law to reimburse us around 60% of an approved rate for the cost of those classes, in addition to um, some city tax levy within our budget. Where will these new seats be located? Uh, our teams have been conducting a needs analysis looking at the geographic distribution of the demand and um, I, I think we can provide more uh, specifics about where the classes have opened up and where they will in the fall, but it is based on where we expect the need to be the greatest in addition to where we have the space to provide the classrooms. Um, how was the DOE able to reallocate $30 million from special education pre-K contracts to fund these seats? So thank you, that's a really important question to clarify that. So this is funding that has existed in our budget for quite some time to support the contracted community-based organization costs associated with the special education pre-K funding. This is just repurposing that funding from schools that um, it's an expense that is um, no longer needed for the community-based organizations to provide support for the special ed pre-K programs that DOE will run itself. Okay, thank you. Um, let me talk a little bit about pay, uh, pay parity. Early childhood providers have raised significant concerns with the early childhood education RFP as released and are calling for the RFPs to be withdrawn. Specifically, they have flagged these concerns. CBO early educators earn $15,000 to $35,000 less than their DOE counterparts. The pay for enrollment plan allows DOE to pay providers less than what is needed to cover cost if enrollment dips, even though DOE controls enrollment centrally. The distinction between core and non-core hours fails to provide the needs of children and their families, in particular poorer families who cannot afford to pay for extended day, holiday, and summer hours. The RFPs fail to provide funding for expenses such as program management and oversight facilities and organizational insurance policies. And the RFPs fail to build a cost Fail to build in cost escalators, although program costs continue to grow and contracts would be for at least five years. So are you planning to address these issues, or how, should I say, how are you planning to address these issues? 
So, Mr. Chair, uh, I have also recently met with leaders from the CBO community, uh, and that is exactly the list of uh, items on our agenda that we spoke about. Uh, so we are engaging at a very high level um, with all of the providers. Uh, we've also had several conversations, I would say conversations slash work sessions uh, with these leaders around trying to address these particular issues. So uh, we are very engaged with them as we speak, and we have been, uh, I, I would say, working very, very aggressively to try to address these particular issues. Okay. It's one of the top priorities of the council going into the final round of budget negotiations that um, we see these, these um, concerns uh, addressed. Uh, in addition to the advocates, the council has called on the administration to fund pay parity across the early childhood education system. If this city decided to invest in pay parity, what would the um, mechanism, what would be the mechanism by which pay parity is achieved? Would the $89 million be added to the DOE's budget? Again, I, uh, what I'll do is I'll ask our CFO if she has any additional information, but there are active conversations right now around pay parity with the union and with the providers, uh, and we have pushed in on those conversations. So there is, there is active work and conversation happening around that. Now, the particulars about what would be the funding mechanism, I, I don't have that detail. Uh, I don't think we have that detail yet, but I can tell you that um, I, I just received a, a briefing uh, last week about some of these conversations, and, and they're moving forward. But. Okay. Um, could DOE issue an, uh, an addendum or an amendment to an RFP that would clarify that the programs could contract for enough funding to pay their staff equitable salaries with education, uh, the salaries with educators employed directly by the DOE? So I believe there is a mechanism for, uh, for an addendum, and part of the conversations that we've been engaged in with these leaders have been what would that look like, if at all, and what would be the parameters of any kind of an addendum. Okay, Our funding for early childhood education programs shifted from ACS to DOE without any additional funding allocated for the uh, upcoming RFP. Clearly, the cost of providing these programs are not the same as when the current contracts at, AC at ACS were issued. The council, as well as early childhood education providers and advocates, have voiced serious concerns regarding the lack of appropriate funding for the RFP. Uh, will the DOE's budget for early childhood education increase? The budgeting process including for this particular issue is under constant review with new information as we in real time are engaging. Uh, the RFP is obviously um, a huge uh, issue for us in, in terms of working with our community uh, about that, but specifics about increasing the budget is just a little premature at this point given the stage of conversations that we're engaged in. At what point do you think we can see it reflected in the financial plan? You know, Mr. Chair, I wish I could tell you specifically, but I think is again, ongoing conversations. We're deeply engaged with uh, the leaders, so um, we hope that this will happen before, before it actually gets put into practice. Mr. Chancellor, can you tell us who you're talking with in the early childhood community? Um, I would prefer at this point, since we've had what we've agreed would be um, private conversations um, to keep them private. We've agreed that because of the sensitivity of what we're doing and how we're talking and what we're talking about, that we would respect each other's privacy. So w with no disrespect to the committee, I, I would prefer that um, I do not name those individuals at this moment. So let's follow up maybe uh, with the council a little bit later off the record on some of these things. We'd be happy to. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chair uh, Traeger now, who's going to ask some questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Drummond. Uh, I, I'm also going to just start off by, you know, as a former teacher in me also, you know, has to begin with some words of, of some positivity, although after, after these initial words, I think we, we will get more intense. But, Mr. Chancellor, I, I do appreciate the fact that you stayed uh, and you listened to the students from Teens Take Charge, that was a very powerful, um, very transpiring session. And of course, we just have to make sure that we 
actualize the vision. Um, and, and so, and again, uh, integrating our public schools uh, will strengthen them, will improve outcomes for all, just like diversifying Tweed will strengthen Tweed and in response to some of the outrageous things I've been reading. So I just want to begin by, by saying that and acknowledging that um, and thanking you for that. But I am not a happy camper when it comes to this budget, Mr. Chancellor, so let's, let's get right to it. Um, the headcount report uh, provided to the council shows an increase of 294 school-based pedagogical headcount, which includes a 542 position increase in school-based teacher titles offset by decreases in other pedagogical titles. How much of this change is attributable to the $125 million invested in increasing fair student funding this year? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your opening remarks as well. We are, I think, um, there is no space between our positions, so I want to thank you. And I'm going to ask our Chief Financial Officer to delve into those details. Good morning, Chair Traeger. Um, thank you for the question. As we've discussed previously, of course, as you know from um, being a school-based uh, person yourself, there's constantly inflows and outflows of pedagogical headcount in our system through a variety of different reasons. Um, the $125 million investment that you referenced, which raised the fi fair student funding floor to 90% at the start of last school year, um, funded a total of approximately 900 um, positions in our schools this past school year and most of those were teachers. Um, were these new positions or existing positions? They were teachers that um, definitely were able to stay in the school uh, this year as a result of the um, advocacy from you and the mayor's office to get that funding in our schools this past school year. Which, which will reinforce a later question of mine why there's no increase in FSF, but how many new positions? Did you have that with you? I don't have the breakdown of that, but uh, again, it was approximately 900 positions. Um, nearly 750 of them were teacher title positions. And do you have any data on how many social workers or? Uh, there were um, some social support staff, counselors, and other types of school support staff. I don't have the breakdown by the specific titles with me today. Uh, did DOE have an initial projections of the headcount increase that would result from FSF? And were there any projections tied to it prior to increasing the budgets? So as you've referenced, this is the most uh, flexible funding source for schools, and so it's a little bit difficult for us to project um, in, in, in real accuracy around that. But as we've previously testified, um, we know from our years of um, raising the floor, and this administration has added over, you know, around 80, $800 million in the fair student funding formula since the start of this administration, that nearly 90% of that funding has gone to support headcount in our schools. So how did DOE direct principals to use the FSF increase? Was any guidance given on their budgeting decisions? For example, were schools without a social worker directed to use FSF support to provide social emotional supports to students? So the, gui the guidance that principals receive, not only on budgeting, but decision making in their schools is really based on what the needs are of their school. So if there is a need for that kind of a position in the school, um, then principals are encouraged to be specific and strategic with using their resources. It would go to one of those positions. The unfortunate reality that we've referenced with the state not funding um, our schools is that without that additional funding, principals are put in a very difficult position oftentimes. Do I hire a teacher to reduce class size, or do I hire a counselor, or do I hire another kind of position? Uh, those are the tough decisions that principals have to make based on the fact that the state isn't living up to its commitment uh, to fund our schools. But it's always the guidance to principals to use their funding specifically to meet the needs at our school, at the school. And that makes, it, that makes it very difficult to say, thou shalt use it this way, because one size doesn't fit all. So I want to give a little color to what we're saying, because I don't want the impression to be that principals don't get guidance. They absolutely get guidance, but it has to be really based on what the needs are of their particular school. And judging on, uh, from uh, 
Ms. Oates' answer, it seems that most of the positions were existing positions, which means that they were just paying for the increased cost of you know, the, our contractual obligations. Um, and I, I'm certainly respectful and mindful of that we have obligations to meet contracts, but the, the purpose of this increase in support to our schools was to better meet the needs of kids by hiring critical support staff, and whether it's reducing class size, whether it's hiring social workers, counselors, um, you, one would imagine that $125 million would make a significant impact in, in doing that, um, but I'm a little bit concerned about some of the answers that we're hearing today. And again, I, as I transfer, I, I agree with you that the state, no one in Albany should be taking a victory lap over the state budget. No one. It actually resulted in a $25 million cut to our school system. So all this talk of schools, not jails, produced a cut to the school system. I just want to note that for all in Albany. Um, is there a concern that the lack of FSF increase to schools this year will result in a significant increase in excess teachers from schools that experience register declines or increased costs that cannot be covered by a level amount of FSF funding? So thank you, Chair Traeger, for that question. Um, we are approaching initial allocations for school budgets as thoughtfully as we can. Um, you know, I think when we are in a, a tight fiscal climate like we are now, we want to make sure that schools understand the resources that they do have available for them, what funding they do have in their budget, and to try to be as thoughtful around how they program those dollars to meet all of their children's needs. Um, I think, as you know, there is a really deep engagement process that takes place over the summer, um, specifically during the month of June while folks are still in school, looking at what their projected registers are for the upcoming school year and trying to and then looking at what their initial allocations are and being as thoughtful as they possibly can around how they can um, you know program their classes to support all of their students needs in the upcoming school year we work with um, the office of the my team works really closely with the office of the first deputy chancellor's um, office uh, with the borough offices to really support uh, as many schools as we possibly can but again you know we're really trying to focus on um, what schools do have in their budgets and what how they can uh, support their students. Ms. Oates, you, you refer to our situation at, quote, tight fiscal climate. I'm having a hard time understanding that when the OMB director testified recently, acknowledged uh, that the city is sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars in new revenue that has come in as a result of personal income tax, tax money. Um, in addition to being the chair of this committee, I'm also a member, just like Chair Drum is, of our budget negotiation team. So I see the same numbers that everyone else sees in the city of New York. We have a budget surplus. We don't, we're not in a tight fiscal climate at this time. Now, in the future, there's always questions of certainty. I, I understand that. But as of this moment, we are not in a tight fiscal climate. There's almost $500 million in additional revenue that just came in after April 15th, which was my birthday as well. But. <laughs> Happy belated birthday. Yes, it should be a gift to the, to the public school system. Um, so I'm going to respectfully push back against this narrative that we are in tight fiscal times. We're not. And the number one priority for us here is our kids. Um, and I'm concerned that if we do not increase FSF, as you pointed out in your answer to my prior question, new, new staff that was hired will be accessed because we have a last in first out system. So if you're a new special education teacher or a new social worker that might have been hired, you might be in danger of losing your job and then accessed into an abyss uh, and hopefully picked up at some point in the future. That's not how our system should work. Our staff, our children, our schools deserve stability and a sense of certainty, especially in a $92 billion budget with hundreds of millions of dollars in added revenue. I want to turn to early childhood education. Um, we understand DOE is requiring that during non-core hours in early childhood education settings, parents must be the slide is up, so Mr. Chancellor, if you could just uh, uh, take a look, glance at that. Uh, according to what we're hearing and according to what we're seeing, 
parents must be U.S. citizens or legal immigrants to enroll their students for services during non-core hours. Does this requirement extend to all non-core hours that DOE will contract for regardless of funding source? If so, why? And Mr. Chancellor, are you aware that this was a presentation provided by DOE? Yeah, so I wasn't aware of this particular slide. Um, this is one of the many grievances that I have with the federal government. Uh, there are certain requirements uh, tied to federal funding which make us have certain requirements or lose the funding. Uh, we are pushing back on that, uh, and I will tell you that we don't uh, require our, student, our parents or our students to have proof of anything except their breathing to get the services that they deserve in New York City. But this is a, from the best that I can tell, this is one of those federal requirements, and we'll get more, more detail on this. And the problem, Mr. Chancellor, and I, I, I believe that you do care about all of our children, and you do understand how significantly problematic this is. The fact is, we're going to lose families and children as a result of this policy. We must address this. Do I have DOE's commitment to address this issue immediately so we don't lose one child, one family from these critical services? Absolutely. Um, this is unacceptable. Uh, but I will also, with that commitment, be very clear about how much money we'll lose in federal funding as well. That is not an excuse, but I want to be very transparent that some of these onerous policies that we are forced to implement have significant dollars associated with them as well. Uh, and that doesn't mean we don't take them on. It just means we have to be very clear about what the implications are. All right. Well, I, 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 I hear you. I, I would just, I think you would agree that we value our children more than outrageous federal strings from a disgraceful federal government right now. Um, we've heard that CBOs uh, providing early childhood education are being asked to pay for their own furniture and technology, even if that technology is required by DOE. In addition, they are being told DOE will not reimburse them for enrichment services such as art and music. Is there a base amount of funding provided to early childhood education CBOs similar to the base amount of funding provided for school budgets? If not, why not? I'm going to ask our C CFO to um, take that question. Uh, thank you for the question. So the current structure for how we pay our um, pre-K providers is a per child amount. Um, and there are some startup costs associated with some of those contracts as we've rolled them out. Um, and that start those startup costs have paid for um, the things that you're referencing, furniture and equipment. Um, and so we, and I can say that under Deputy Chancellor Wallach's team, his team is working really closely with the community-based organizations and really monthly reviewing their budgets and their needs. And, um, and so we are doing our best to be responsive to um, issues um, that you raise. Ms. Oates, you know, when it comes to FSF, every school has a base amount of money just to open up shop. I think it's around $225,000 somewhere, thanks to your comprehensive charts that <laughs> I, I paid attention to. We need to apply the same thinking and the same strategy to our, to our CBO providers as well, because there are startup costs. Uh, they're spending money out of their own budgets to just make sure that their spaces are in compliance with the health department, your, your regulations, and there is an expectation from DOE for them to use iPads, for example, but they can't use the money that you provide them for iPads. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that specific issue, sir. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of, Mr. Chancellor, I think we have to add to your plate of conversations uh, that you have, and, and we like to be a part of that because we wanna make sure that there's funding in place to stabilize CBO. I don't, I don't say it lightly that Many, because 60% of, of the UPK services, for example, are provided by our CBO partners. I don't say lightly that many of them are on the brink. I don't, that's, it's not a talking point for me. I want this to work. I want UPK and 3K, I want all this to work. But when I keep hearing from providers from across the boroughs, they can't take this on, they don't have enough resources, they can't retain staff, that's a problem. And from, from an instructional lens, Mr. Chancellor, 
kids at four, three years old should not be seeing new adults in front of their class every month or two. That's damaging to instruction. It's damaging to their formative years. So I know there's, there's, there's budgetary implications, but for me, the teacher in me cares about the instruction happening in, in, that, in that classroom. Uh, I want to turn now to, um, to social workers. In our fiscal 2020 prelim budget response, the council called for the DOE to dedicate $13.75 million to hire an additional 110 social workers for high-need schools. There are more than 700 schools that do not have a full-time social worker on staff, and for those schools that do not have a social worker and guidance counselor, the ratio of these support staff to students are often egregiously high. Why wasn't this included in the exec budget, especially when the administration exceeded its $750 million target in identifying cost savings, and the administration was able to add over $350 million to DOE's executive budget? So again, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, we believe very strongly that there should be a robust um, social emotional support system at every school. In fact, I created a whole division to focus us on uh, providing those services as well. Um, as it pertains to the budget, I budget what I get. I don't create my budget. I, I have to live within the means. So I will take your word for it that there is a um, a surplus of funding. I hope that that trickles back to us. <laughs> I trust that you will push that conversation. You um, trust correct? Uh, yes. Uh, so we believe, again, in social workers. We believe in counselors. I, I think it's, it's a little more in, uh, clear to understand in those 700 schools where there are, as you've mentioned, no social workers, there are social emotional supports. Uh, there are counselors in those schools. It's not as if those schools have no support system. Um, we would like to have more robust staffing, but as I've said, and, and this is not in any way, shape, or form being dismissive, uh, it's a matter of money. So if we get more money for our schools, if the state would finally live up to its responsibility and fund the fiscal equity plan, uh, that money goes directly to schools, which can be used then to hire these kinds of positions. Um, so we are, as part of our budget process as well, looking to identify internal resources as well that we can add to the resources going to schools. Uh, but I want to be very, very clear for everyone that's listening that there, there aren't bags of money um, at the DOE. So when we move something, something else gets cut, something else gets impacted, uh, and we want to be very thoughtful that as we're doing that work, we keep that in mind as well so that it's supporting school sites. So, Mr. Chancellor, I, I appreciate that answer, but I, I, just, I just have to remind the DOE that in the last budget, the city council actually stepped up and put in uh, $2 million to hire counselors $2 million to add more Bridging the Gap social workers. And if it was not for the amazing City Council Finance Division, I'm not sure if these folks would have been hired because they were hired way past the start of the school year. Many of them were hired in January. And as a matter of fact, I'm being told that not every position has been hired. So when we say that you're budgeting for what you have, you actually did have some revenue that for whatever reason was held up. And so my question is, um, these hiring restrictions, because it's my understanding that there's still a freeze on hiring counselors and social workers, is that correct? There, uh, along with every city agency, there is a hiring freeze on all positions. What we've done in the DOE is that school-based positions have the greatest priority. So we are making exceptions to the freeze every day. So. As you referenced earlier, there are um, counselors, there are social workers, there are teachers that have been accessed from other schools. We ask our principals and school communities to look at that pool first. Um, I think it just makes sense that these are, many of them, educators just got accessed. Um, there are no disciplinary issues, there are no issues that would preclude them from being hired. So we do ask our principals to look at that pool first. I think it's fiscally responsible. I think it's also instructionally responsible. Um, and if that list doesn't produce a candidate and they interview a candidate that's external, there is a freeze. There's a process to request that freeze be lifted for that hire, and we do it every day. 
So the best of my knowledge is that we are not precluding people from hiring these critical positions. The, the, the important note here is that they have to have the resources to hire these people. And the, the campaign for fiscal equity and the funding we're still owed would, be, would go a long way to help us get those resources in place. Right. So is, are, are, is the DOE continuing the freeze in, into, the, into the coming school year again? Again, we're part of the city, and the city, the direction we have is that there is a fiscal issue. Uh, there is an austere budget environment, so we have a freeze. Um, but what we have done is prioritized school-facing positions, um, and as I've mentioned, there is a process for being able to hire into those positions, and that's happening every day. Mr. Chancellor, we're requesting that if the council funds these positions, which quite frankly we shouldn't have to, but we are because that's how important they are to the council, we're asking that these positions are not subject to, the, to, this, uh, to these hiring uh, uh, restrictions. And I'd like to get your commitment on that, that if we're funding them, if, we're hire, hire, if we want to fund social workers and counselors adding revenue to DOE's budget, they should not be subject uh, to, to these freeze uh, restrictions. So I, th I think we're on the same page here. Uh, I just want to be very clear that if it's a position we have a pool of educators that have those titles. We are going to continue in that same process. You look there first, and then if there's another candidate that schools are gonna be free then to hire, and there's a process for then documenting why that is being allowed to go forward. So I think we're talking about the same thing here, sir. We're committed to that as well. Right, and, and I'm mindful, I'm very much cognizant of what ATRs are, and, and I understand that. You know, the, 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 the excess pool, it, I'm hearing from schools on the ground that a number of them who they've tried to interview don't show up for whatever reason, and they are just months and months and months in bureaucratic limbo, and the position is not filled in their school. And there is money in, to hire them. And so I, I just would like for us to work on this so there's, we don't hire these key staff in the middle of the school year, but we hire them at the start of, of the school year. Um, I just want to move on because uh, I'm going to be mindful of my colleagues' time. But uh, we understand the city is under a compliance assurance uh, plan related to the provision of special education and related services for the 2018-2019 school year. This plan requires an increase in the allocation of staffing resources. Does the investment in the executive budget reflect the DOE's required corrective action? And if yes, can you provide a breakdown of the investments in the executive budget that match the required corrective action in the compliance assurance plan? And if no, how much further investment is required and when will that investment be reflected in the budget? So the city of New York, along with other school systems in the state of New York, um, are under a compliance review and a compliance assurance plan by the state education department. Uh, the, number, the number of other districts, uh, we can get back to you. Part of the investment that is being made in our special education services will help with some of the compliance issues that are included in that uh, CAP plan. Um, we can get you details as specifically what areas and how that's going to be impacted. The bottom line, though, is that we, as we've worked with the state education department, uh, we've been very clear that we aspire to do more than what's in that compliance plan. The compliance plan is what it is. It's about compliance. What we're really trying to do is build a better system that provides services for our students and gives the information and the support to parents they need to make their decisions. So we can come back with more details specifically about how those investments will help with that compliance assurance plan, uh, but we're really looking beyond that compliance assurance plan to build a better system in its entirety. Right, and, and I'm just mindful, Mr. Chancellor, you remember that we, we, we had a seven hour hearing on special education here in the city council, which was very sobering. Um, and I, I, the mayor, I understand, you know, mentioned, highlighted the increased money in terms of Carter cases. Um, I just, my issue with that Carter case is that number one, many working families that, that I represent, I speak to, never even heard of them before. And even if they did hear of them, they don't have the means to shell out thousands and thousands of dollars to wait for reimbursement that might not even come because we've heard complaints about long reimbursement wait times. 
And so we desperately need to make sure that we are in housing as much as possible, identifying those service gaps within our system and providing services within the DOE system and not be at the, at the mercy of the private market. We are 100% with you, yes. Um, DOE is taking savings, I'm turning turn now to headcounts in borough offices, central administration. DOE is taking savings by reducing central administration and borough office headcount as the council recommended. However, the executive budget still reflects a net increase in headcount in both central administration and borough offices. How does DOE justify the need for so many additional central and borough staff? Why aren't these resources being allocated directly to schools? So I'll ask our CFO to add um, some more detail to this, but keep in mind that the lessons we learned from, uh, for example, the renewal approach was that embedded coaching at school sites was extremely effective in helping schools instructionally do better. In other words, instead of taking teachers, and as a teacher you'll, you'll appreciate this, and taking teachers for training outside of the building and then expecting them to come back and implement, well, part of that model was that we had coaches that would actually come into the schools, work side by side with teachers, do in-school coaching. Those positions become centralized. They become borough-based because you have to allocate them and, and, and they float and they go to different schools. So much of the headcount that you're gonna see are around those kinds of embedded coaching type positions that we know from the data here in New York City made a, a significant impact in some of our most historically underserved schools. Uh, I'm gonna ask our CFO if she has any additional insight into those numbers as well. Thank you, Chair. So, you know, again, as we talked about with uh, school-based headcount, uh, our field and central-based headcount is constantly fluctuating. Um, one of the things that we participated, we DOE participated in, along with all other city agencies, are headcount reductions related to the citywide partial hiring freeze. Those heads will be taken out of our, our central budget, and we're constantly looking at how we can provide our services centrally and at the field level more efficiently. Um, one of the things that um, is contributing to perhaps some of the headcount growth that you see um, is related to some insourcing efforts that are taking place um, across our field-based offices and some of our central offices to provide permanent staff to functions um, that may have been staffed in other ways um, in the past. And so that contributes to some of the potential increase that you're seeing in the budget. I mean, I, I'm just looking at the chart that you, you can see here as well. I, I, I'm just having a difficult time grapple, grappling with the fact that there are more borough office support staff than social workers in the entire school system. There's something wrong here. Um, and headcount has increased in these borough offices. And respectfully, I am still not clear on all of their roles and responsibilities because what I am hearing from schools, they want direct services inside their schools. So it's nice to have folks housed somewhere, but folk, schools would like to have social workers or critical services housed in their schools to provide direct services to students. And with the caveat that they are licensed and qualified to provide mm -hmm. those services. So we don't disagree with you, sir. I think what's uh, my analysis as the educator, uh, as the chancellor, is that the system was not set up to provide those just-in-time resources. So I can't expect a social worker that is providing direct services at a school to be responsible for five schools and also be responsible for doing professional development and elbow-to-elbow -elbow coaching with other social workers. I can't expect a social worker to teach English or to teach math or to teach science, uh, much less be the coach that is helping with the pedagogy of that math teacher, of that science teacher, of that English teacher. So I, I get, once again, I, I think we're talking about the same kind of system of, of supports for instruction and wraparound services at schools. I'm gonna reiterate, we are in a difficult budget situation and we are being as focused as we can to make sure that the resources that we have are supporting what's happening in the school sites. 
That being said, I would be more than happy to have a briefing session where we can take you through exactly what the strategic plan is and how we're allocating these resources. I will also tell you that I spend a lot of time out in the field and I completely respect the fact you're hearing from folks. I've got 1,800 people that I hear from. And I can tell you that across the system, what I'm hearing loud and clear from our principals and quite frankly our teachers is that they want this kind of support. And if they see this kind of support being allocated, that they are okay with that. Um, so again, I think a, a good work session where we could actually go through that plan would be, uh, I think, a good thing for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just respond and I'll move on, Mr. Chancellor, that I, I, and I, I, I am mindful that you visit schools a lot and I respect that, I appreciate that. I just, I, I haven't heard from teachers ask me, help me teach math, but they do ask me, how do I address the trauma that my students are experiencing in their communities and in our schools? I can't reach them. And so it's, it's not just about the, the quadratic formula, it's about how do I reach kids that are experiencing a whole host of social emotional issues. So I'm just, just trying to be, to be mindful of that. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, school food. According to a report required by Local Law 60 of 2011, in the 2017-2018 school year, only 420 schools had implemented breakfast in the classroom. How many schools are implementing breakfast in the classroom in the current school year? Um, our CFO has those numbers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so as of um, May of this year, um, so this month, about 525 schools in 475 buildings have implemented the breakfast in the classroom program. Can you say it one more time? Sorry. Yes. Uh, 525 schools in 475 buildings have implemented the Breakfast in the Classroom program as of this month. Out of how many schools? Approximately 1,800. Why, why isn't this happening across the board? So I am a big, big proponent of making sure that our students all have a nutritious breakfast, they have lunch, and in many of our schools they also get supper. I think breakfast in the classroom, and I've been involved with breakfast in the classroom in two other school systems that I've led. Um, I think we need to stop talking about breakfast in the classroom and talk about breakfast in the stomach. It's important that kids have breakfast, and what happens in a system like ours that is so large and so complex is that some of our schools have not been able to just logistically be able to accommodate the breakfast in the classroom. Breakfast in the classroom is important. And in some of those schools, it's worked well. And quite frankly, some of those schools, it hasn't worked well. So what we have said and what I have directed in the DOE is that our goal should be that students get breakfast, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's before they get into the classroom. Uh, is really, from my perspective, not as important as they get breakfast. I will also share that we have examples of schools that do not have breakfast in the schools uh, program that have a much higher participation rate than some of the schools that have breakfast in the classroom. So it, it really is about making sure that students are getting the food um, and then they're getting food that they wanna eat and that is nutritious and healthy. Um, so I do not wanna discount breakfast in the classroom. Uh, but I also want to be really clear that if a school does not have a breakfast in the classroom implementation, it doesn't mean that students are not getting fed. And we're really monitoring what are the participation rates in our schools. Uh, and again, would be happy to sit with you and your staff and share those numbers as well. Mr. Chancellor, I know this program rolled out prior to your arrival, but what I want to share with you is that, and I, I hear directly from schools, is that there was very little guidance as far as implementation for, of the program. And you couple that with the fact that last, in the last budget, in the middle of the school year, DOE took away money from custodians' budgets in our schools, which the DOE counted as surpluses, which they count as reserves because they wait until spring break, for example, when the buildings are clear, to clean the building. And so if you cut custodian budgets, cut janitor budgets, that's the, why some schools have difficulty with implementation because the issue is who cleans the spilled milk or the, clean, or, or the spilled oranges. These are fixable items. This is not rocket science to address. 
And I just don't think we should drop the ball on this critical initiative. And I understand that kids can get technically options elsewhere, but one of the reasons why this program was, was established because many school communities, for whatever reason, that, that right or that information never trickled down to the kids. This way you ensure that they're eating. You ensure that they are receiving the, their nutrition. There's no ambiguity around nutrition. Because you agree with me that kids cannot learn if they're hungry. And they don't always know that they have a right to go out, go out downstairs and ask to the cafeteria. This program was set up to address and to remove any, any ambiguity or confusion about their rights in the schools. Um, last thing, because I turn to my colleagues. Um, in fiscal 2019, the council funded a halal and kosher school lunch pilot. We understand this pilot rolled out at nine schools last month. Can you tell us how much DOE expects to spend on this pilot uh, th this year? And can you tell us how many kosher halal meals DOE expects to serve? We assume DOE had to estimate this, this in order for the appropriate vendors to be prepared to provide meals. So I could tell you it's, the pilot is currently active in 10 schools. Um, and in 10 schools, students can receive a kosher or halal meal um, today. Um, lots of lessons learned in this pilot program. As you know, we've met numerous times with council staff and council members. We appreciate your support in that. Um, but for example, for halal, um, the council may be very aware of this, but the public may not be aware. And even I wasn't aware that if you're going to have a halal uh, option for students, there surely must be somebody that prepares that and we can just order a halal meal. It's much more complex than that. We, we actually brought in imams that came into the preparation facility of the selected vendor and had to ensure that the way the meals were being prepared was uh, in accordance to all of the regulations and guidelines. Then they had to go into our schools, every one of those 10 schools, and again, review, uh, work with the school nutrition staff and ensure that they're being prepared uh, according to the guidelines. Then the particular sourcing of uh, the meals. So for example, if there is chicken, how is the chicken being slaughtered and are they following guy? Incredibly complex. But I think we did it right in that we included the community, we included the religious community, we made sure that everybody was guiding us as how we went forward. Um, and that's part of why we have these 10 pilot schools and we're learning more and more about that every single day. We would not been, have been able to do that without the support of the council because it was incredibly important to be able to have that kind of a robust process. In terms of the specific numbers in terms of salary, and or not salary, in terms of budget, um, as I've mentioned, we are right in the midst of the pilot. So what I will commit to doing is getting as much of that information as we can uh, and then sharing that uh, in written form. I, I, I would really appreciate that information, Mr. Chancellor, because it's now, we're in the middle of the holy month of Ramadan which is an issue for many of our Muslim students, and we have less than a month left in school. Yeah. So the pilot was supposed to roll out this, this school year, and we just still don't have clarity on how many meals were served, but we would like to follow up with your sure. folks, senior folks, yeah. to make sure that this is addressed expeditiously. And I'm gonna to turn to my colleagues over, but Mr. Chancellor, this morning before I came uh, to this hearing, I stood in the steps of City Hall with these extraordinary students and staff here of MS50 um, in Brooklyn, where a promise was made to them um, that we would not cut a dime in any of the renewal rise schools. And uh, I said not, not a dime should be cut for extended learning time. In this school, the program is working. We've, we're, we're seeing improved results. We don't cut things. From, first of all, we shouldn't break promises to kids. And we should not cut what is working for our school communities. And again, I'm going to push back against this narrative that we're in tight fiscal times. Any city across, whether it's Mr. Chancellor, whether it's Houston or San Francisco or New York City, any city that has $500 million in surplus revenue, that is not tight fiscal time. We have the money and the responsibility to restore every single cut that is proposed in this executive budget. We have a commitment to these kids, and that's why we are fired up here today in, in the city council. I'm gonna turn back now to my colleagues uh, to ask questions. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger. We have been joined by Councilmember Ulrich, Moya, Kalos, Borelli, Powers, and Jonai. And we have questions starting with Councilmember Gordenchik, followed by Councilmember Reynoso. 
Thank you, uh, Chairs. Uh, good morning, Chancellor. Good morning, Ms. Grillo. We still see you there, don't worry. Uh, we know you're here. Um, I got three minutes to go over the entire education budget of the city of New York. I, I, I do want to reiterate um, a lot of what the chairs said. Uh, Chancellor, I have excellent educators. I have 32 schools in my district between 26, 29, and District 75. Um, I'm proud of each and every one of those principals and the people that work in those schools. And there is nothing more important in my visits to schools that has been impressed upon me than increasing the allocation for fair student funding. And um, that's the glue in many ways uh, that fills in gaps that uh, otherwise are not going to be um, filled in. And I want to uh, impress on that. I know I've mentioned it to you, but here we are today, and I'm just gonna continue um, to talk about that. Um, I uh, appreciate the, uh, I wanna zero in on one thing that has bothered me. Um, I appreciate the advancements we've made um, in computers um, and the education of our children, computer science, computer technology, especially um, the increases for uh, young women. Um, Robert Kahn, who was the co-inventor of the internet, um, people have heard me talk about that, is a product of the New York City school system, graduate of CCNY. Um, so there is a press in here for great things. The thing that troubles me and troubles many of my colleagues is that if I don't buy technology for the schools, they don't have new technology. We are spending almost $34 billion a year. $34 billion a year. And I have to go from school to school and provide them not with 25 or 50, most of my schools get $100,000 a year for technology because without me, there is no new technology. I have visited schools, fortunately this has uh, been abated, but my first tour of the schools, I ran into schools where some of the technology was nearly a decade old. And I just wanna know, uh, also wanna follow up um, the iPads. Everybody wants them, we can't buy them. And I, I guess maybe uh, we should talk about that further. I'd like to know what we're doing uh, to increase and update the technology in our schools so that I can spend my money on doing new playgrounds with Ms. Grillo. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words and I'll ask our CFO to answer some of the more technical uh, parts of you your You got question. 22 seconds, go ahead. I have 22 seconds, I'll be quick. <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree with you, I think technology is incredibly important. It doesn't replace teaching, but it facilitates learning for students. Uh, I can tell you that in the 14 months that I've been here, we have doubled the bandwidth that schools have and accelerated even the connectivity for schools. Uh, part of the uh, strategic plan, the five-year capital plan, has funding in it for technology as well. Um, we are also working with, and I have um, partnered with the city to uh, work with um, business and industry um, around an initiative of getting some technology into our schools so that they have a place to, uh, a piece of the pie, if you will. We are in the process of hiring a new chief information officer, a new technology officer position, uh, and job number one will be a master plan for the uh, modernization of our technology in our schools. Um, and the other thing that I would say is in terms of the, the budgeting and the, the contracting and the procurement of certain kinds of devices, we actually, we're actually taking a very deep look at that because we, we do wanna be sure that we can support what schools get, but we also wanna make sure that what schools are getting are what they wanna be able to use. So uh, I'm gonna ask uh, our CFO if she has any additional comments. Yes, thank you, sir. So in addition to that, one of the um, opportunities that will roll out this coming school year is the Smart Schools Bond Act funding, which you may recall came into existence in around 2014. It took us four years to work with the state to get that technology plan actually approved. It happened this past, uh, at the end of 2018, and we will be rolling out those dollars, those allocations to public schools. It'll mean $106 million um, to support devices, you know, equipment, devices in schools, 
tools. Um, laptops and tablets are included in that. And so we will be rolling out that funding um, throughout the upcoming school years. And so we're really excited about that opportunity. It obviously, those devices only work so much as they can hook up with the broadband that we are pushing out to schools. So while we have been pushing out the broadband to schools, these devices will be a nice complement to the increased broadband in schools. In addition to the state reimbursement funding coming to us, there's $750 million in the capital plan that supports technology upgrades. And so we are constantly working on that and refreshing um, the circuits in our schools so that they can support the new devices they will receive. Thank you. I was recently at Van Buren, and you know I talk about that all the time, uh, that they inducted the uh, CEO of Thermo Fisher Scientific into their Hall of Fame, um, and he brought along $30,000 worth of new science equipment, and I was happy to see mostly young women in that class and mostly uh, children of color. Um, and Ms. Grillo, I need a new field there. I <laughs> must have one. Thank you. Thank you, Ma Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Sure. Let me just say, how did you get around the um, prohibition by the, ch by the controller's office on the tablets? So the uh, tablets are, are specifically called out in the state rules around the Smart Schools Bond Act. And it, the state program is a reimbursement program that will not run through the city's capital program. It actually will run through our expense budget. So there will no, no, be no bonding out for devices. Do you know how much uh, that's going to cost for the tablets? The, it's $106 million to support new equipment in schools, and that will roll out. There is no end date for that money, so we will be rolling it out to schools over the next several years. Is there a priority to which schools they go to? Because special education is, is especially important for those kids, I think. There is an assistive technology component that is associated with that funding, um, but it is a per capita based um, dollar value for schools. And there uh, will be more guidance coming to schools in the fall. We are looking at the economic needs of schools as we are considering this allocation. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember Reynoso, followed by Councilmember Brandon. Uh, thank you, chairs. Uh, thank you for being here to, to all. Um, I just saw. Uh, a couple of things. First, uh, I don't want to speak to who wrote it, but there was an article written recently here in the city of New York related to the work that you're doing um, to uh, work against implicit bias and diversify your team. Um, and for a long time, uh, people of color have had to do go above and beyond to prove their worth um, in a lot of the work that we do. And for you to acknowledge the fact that we need to start shaking things up to get new outcomes, um, I'm extremely proud. Uh, I was proud to, to actually see your name on that. Wear it as a badge of honor. Um, and if you need anything, please look to me as a, as a partner. Um, absolutely. Uh, the next thing is what we have here. This is uh, the greatest school in all of the city of New York, the greatest middle school in all of the city of New York, the school I went to, junior high school 50, or MS 50. Can you guys just stand up? I want them to, to be acknowledged and to, so that folks can see. All right. I just need them to move around. All right. You guys need to shake it up a little bit. Um, the great thing about Junior High School 50 is that they are a nationally recognized debate team. They will be going to national soon to uh, debate against other states, I guess. Um, but one thing that I can't get past is that the reason they have a debate team is because they have something called ELT, or Extended Learning Time. And it is something that is being considered for a cut by this administration in a time when I agree with our chair of education, we are not in fiscal constraints right now. Um, we've actually given the Department of Education $600 million worth of savings that they can take up. On top of that, they have another half a million that they found in April 15th outside of the two billion that actually already existed in the surplus. So the fact that these young people that have, because of the funding that you've given them, been able to put themselves on the map, a renewal school losing students and underachieving, underperforming statistically now has turned that around. They're increasing their student population. They're a nationally recognized debate team. Um, their performance is going up. Their attendance rate is going up. Everything that you would ask for, they've done. This school has done it. And now they're being threatened. We're, being, we're threatening to cut their uh, extended learning time. So I want to have a conversation with you about the debate how that debate would look, where I would have two of these young students sit against you, Carranza, so that you would have to be on the, on the side of saying extended learning time can be cut in schools, because they would happily argue that it shouldn't be cut, and they are a testament to that. I just need you to help me help you explain to them 
why extended learning time is not a value. But you guys can sit down. But thank you so much for being here, Junior High School 50. We love you very much. And because my time is going to be done, I do want to also ask, um, uh, related to, I'm sorry, uh, related to breakfast in the classrooms, yeah. um, I need to see statistically as well. I, I'm, I'm a Junior High School 50 kid. I just need stats and data to show that breakfast in the classroom is not working. Um, I don't mind you showing me, if it's not working, then we can have a conversation. But from everything I've received so far, it's actually showing an increase in the amount of students that are eating breakfast. Mm -hmm. and I just don't want another plan. First, extended learning time and this are two models that have shown success. And I don't want to move away from things that are working. Uh, Chancellor, there's a lot of things I think are, might not be working, but these things are working. So those are my two questions and statements. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, you really want me to debate against one of these young championship debate? I'm out of my league. <laughs> you know? I'm going to tell you right now. Yes, I'm scared. Um, but um, so ELT, um, again, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with uh, the chair more. Again, we had to make some very difficult decisions. Um, the very one of the one of the priority areas that we have is if there is additional dollars. Uh, this is one of those things that uh, is prioritized to come back. That being said, as we considered um, whether ELT would be one of those budget cuts, we actually met with principals, we talked to principals, we, we asked principals, especially in the renewal rise uh, cohort of, of schools, um, of all of the components that you had at your disposal, what is the most important thing, and are there any components that were not um, as, as robust or didn't give you as much as what you need? The number one thing that all of the principals said unanimously was, do not cut our fair student funding formula. Because in our renewal schools, in our rise schools, we lifted all of those schools to 100% FSF. So that's why you have seen there is no proposal to cut that. The second thing that they said almost unanimously was do not touch our community schools approach. In other words, having a coordinator, helping them to make connections with community-based organizations. You will also see that that was not proposed as well. For a good majority of the principals, they spoke very highly about their extended learning time. But they also, there were a number of principals that shared with us difficulty in actually utilizing extended learning time. It, it was a variety of issues. Either they didn't have um, the, the teachers or the other support staff that they could get to stay, or they didn't have a robust programming, or they didn't have a partnership. There were a number of issues that made it difficult for them to, in a robust way, implement extended learning time. However, there were, and, and don't quote me on this one, but I think there were about eight schools that told us this is critically important to us. This middle school is one of those middle schools that said this is critically important to us, we used it well. So we are engaging right now in a process with those school leaders around us finding the resources so that whether or not there's additional resources that come to our budget, uh, that we are looking internally to find the resources to make sure that this kind of programming that is working well is not hampered in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, you have, you have my commitment that that's a, a, an area of focus and priority for us. Um, I know to your second question around breakfast in the schools, in the classroom, I agree with you. We should always be looking for that participation rate. And you're right, citywide uh, participation for breakfast uh, writ large is about 27%, which is not okay. Uh, and we know that breakfast uh, in the classroom participation, that whole cohort uh, participation was about 41%. So it, you're absolutely right. Where it's implemented, implemented well, it's been effective. But I can also share with you, for example, Roberto Clemente uh, School in Manhattan. They are not a breakfast in the classroom school. They have 75% participation rate. So we, we want to find out how are you doing that? How are you making that happen? PS 396 in the Bronx, is not a breakfast in the classroom school. They have 71% participation rate. Again, we all want 100, but they are outpacing even breakfast in the classroom schools and obviously the citywide participation. So we just want to be thoughtful and continue to support schools 
and I and I know that you didn't say this, but I want to I want to make sure that there's not a misconception that we're eliminating the breakfast in the classroom program. We're not. We're just not growing it this year based on the budget uh, peg that we've submitted. But again, we will gladly welcome additional support to continue to grow it in the future. I'm sorry. Just a follow-up to the breakfast in the classrooms. Um, doesn't mm, the majority of the money for breakfast in the classroom come from the federal government? Um, so I, I just don't see why how that would be a savings, given that the money's coming from a different, a different uh, entity, uh, government entity. Thanks for that question. So uh, there is a reimbursement for the cost of the meal, but the breakfast in the class model is a, is a slightly more expensive model than serving it in the cafeteria because it involves additional labor from sc our school lunch um, st and breakfast staff in, the, in schools, as well as um, delivering the food from the cafeteria to the different classrooms. So that has involved, you know, things such as carts, but also building out refrigeration units in different parts of the school, those kinds of things, depending on the size of your school that, ha that are not reimbursed um, by, the, by the per meal cost. Thank you, and just as a follow-up, um, I think you're cutting $2 million from the um, Middle School Quality Initiative as well. What was your thinking around around that. That's a program that the council has supported. I think we've given uh, $750,000 toward it every year as well, and it was initiated by the council many years ago, and um, quite frankly, I think it's one of the more successful programs. So um, how did you come to that conclusion to take $2 million away from MSQI? I, I think in very complicated budget terms, Mr. Chair, we, we refer to it as giving it a haircut. We're, we're not cutting it completely. Uh, but again, as we were um, given the charge by the city council, obviously in our last testimony, and the mayor's uh, office to find efficiencies, uh, we feel confident that the, the cut that we are proposing is not going to affect the classrooms in this program. And we're looking at the efficiencies that we've been able to build with our reorganization to have that support um, still supporting the initiative itself. So we're reducing some staff, we're reducing some of the, what we think was important, but I think we, we feel strongly that we can reorganize and reprioritize some of the other work strands to support this without it affecting the classroom implementation. Okay, from my understanding though, the, the um, director of the program didn't even know that there was going to be these cuts. So um, I'd like to have a, a discussion, you know, with you and her and, um, this is a pr program that we have seen work, and I, I'd like to get some further details about what that <coughs> shaving of the program uh, actually means. So we'll do that offline, I think. Happy to do that, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Council Member Brannon, followed by Adams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try to be as quick as I can. For 3K, do, I've heard a whole bunch of different things. Do we have a definite date of when 3K is going to be citywide? We, we don't have a specific date. Okay, so not a year, we don't know. It, it's all resource dependent, so as the budget is in flux and we're trying to get some parameters to that, we should be a little more specific, but at this point, sir, we don't have a specific date. Okay. Um, I have to belabor the point um, about the CBOs and the pre-K. Um, I think what we have here is uh, a crisis of confidence when it comes to the CBOs that even though um, they are aware um, that the DOE has made plans to address the funding challenges going forward, um, they're not feeling it. And um, I don't know how we can get them to feel it, but I want to find a way. I mean, you, you know, I'm hearing from CBOs in my district that have been around for decades who now for the first time ever are considering having, you know, having to close their doors. Um, and in the most part, they blame the DOE because they feel that they're being cannibalized by the, the, the pre-K centers that are opening. And these are CBOs that say in the early days of pre-K when we were trying to do everything, we, and I was there for it, so I remember we were trying to, you know, add seats wherever we could, these guys were there. Um, and now that things have leveled out, as you mentioned before, they're feeling like they've just been sort of tossed away. and, and I understand why they feel that way. And we've done a lot of work, and, and um, uh, Chancellor Wallach has been great, and we've done a lot of work there, but the, the CBOs are just not feeling it. And, and 
I want to make sure that we're getting that message across to them because no matter what I tell them, no matter what DOE is doing, there's, there's a real gap there that, that I hope that we, can, um, that we can make them believe that you guys are going to take care of them. So I really appreciate that, uh, Councilman Member uh, Brandon. So I think, uh, yes, I've heard that as well. Uh, I have personally, as Chancellor, as I had mentioned earlier, now met with uh, leaders in the, in the early education community, the community-based organizations. Uh, we have work teams. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach and his team have been tirelessly now uh, working with different groups of our CBO partners. So uh, again, I think more than just from appearances, the fact that the Chancellor uh, himself is meeting with folks uh, speaks to the level of seriousness that we're taking it. Um, I think there is uh, room to actually meet a lot of uh, a, a lot of the concerns. So people are hearing that and, and, and again as we continue to do this work understanding that uh, that um, w that time is is of the essence uh, I think you're going to start to feel a little bit more urgency or you're going to start to hear from our community-based organizations that, uh, nope, this is really a priority and the DOE is taking it seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Adams followed by Gibson. Thank you, Chairs Drum and Traeger. Um, good to see you, Chancellor. Good to see you, Ms. Grillo, and your wonderful staff for being here today. We really appreciate your testimony as always. Uh, first of all, I just want to commend you uh, for the work that you've done across the board in all of our districts um, in bringing and doing your best to try to create the uh, equity and equality in our schools that we so desperately need. Uh, New York is the most segregated uh, place in the nation as far as I know. So thank you for all of your help in, in uh, trying to get us to the place that we need to be. In a whole. That said, I'm going to go into to, uh, the bleak part of my line of questioning, and that is that I have a problem. I have an issue uh, with the optics of this budget. Um, I have a very big problem with the optics of this administration, and the more we look at this uh, executive budget, the more that we uh, dig deeper, those of us that are on the budget negotiating team, um, the, the more troubling all of this gets. Uh, we are right now looking at an administration who doesn't seem to care that the optics are problematic across the city. We're looking at closing senior centers. Now we're looking at cutting breakfast for children. We're looking at not funding or, or not giving more <coughs> thought to pay parity and social workers, Title IX, the list goes on and on and on, and the optics are horrendous. So I'm just going to switch gears just a little bit. I had to get that off my, off my chest. But I'm in a district that is represented by a large number of co-located schools, uh, which has been an issue of mine for a very, very long time. I've always been adamantly opposed to co-location. So we've been talking about cutting school breakfast, but in co-located schools, we have something that is known as 10 o'clock lunch. I never understood it. Maybe you can explain it. Um, we know that the USDA mandates that schools offer lunches between 10 and 2, but how many New York City schools offer lunch earlier than 10 a.m.? Um, I can get you that specific number and follow up. I don't have it at my uh, fingertips. Okay. Then I'll ask, why are schools allowed to offer lunch earlier than 10 a.m.? So I share your concern, and um, a few months ago, um, I publicly stated that we are reviewing all of our lunch times in our schools. Uh, that's really, really important. It, it also relates to not only lunch times, but start times as well. If I may, and I just want to tell you, as a high school principal, um, as a high school principal in Las Vegas, I had a school that was built for 2,700 students, and we had a student population of 4,000 students. The cafeteria was built to serve 2,900 students. So in a very real sense, I was serving lunch. I was one of those 10 o'clock lunch servers because I could only fit so many students in my cafeteria at a time and I needed to have six lunch periods. 
So we had to start at 10 to be able to get them all through by two. Um, it was just a matter of logistics. It was horrible. We ended up working out a solution, which I'm not even gonna mention publicly because it, it was crazy, but it helped in that situation. Um, in many of our co-located facilities, and I also share concerns about co-locations with you, um, it is really a, a, a matter of just the physical plant and how you can accommodate students. That being said, there are ways to be creative and thoughtful about how we serve lunch. And part of our analysis is actually understanding where are, what are the issues? Is it a facilities issue? Is it a scheduling issue? Is it a food provisioning issue? What is the issue? Because I guarantee you, whatever the issue is, we can find a way to make it so that students aren't eating brunch. Uh, they're actually having lunch. Uh, so we share your concern. I personally share your concern as well on that issue. Thank you. I, I really would like to see those numbers across the board. How many of our students are going through this? And, and, and I'll just end with this. We, we have this term called underutilization, and I think that it is grossly overused mm -hmm. and horribly misinterpreted when it comes to the way that we are assessing budgetary items and prioritization in the city. So I think that we need to take a look at the way that we are using this word because it is affecting our most vulnerable, our seniors particularly, and our children. So let's just be more mindful of the way that we are using the expression under utilization. Thank you very much for your yes, testimony. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson, followed by Councilmember Kalos. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and Chair Traeger, and good afternoon, Chancellor and CFO, Deputy Chancellor, President, everyone here, thank you. Um, I also want to just echo the sentiments of all of my colleagues that have spoken and just really commending the Department of Ed and SCA. We know how hard you work every single day, and particularly as a Bronx Council member on behalf of my school district, District 9, um, I want to say thank you because for so many years the Bronx has been disinvested and short funded for a long time. And so I feel like this is our opportunity to not only talk about it, but make sure that there are resources and programs. And all credit to my District 9 teachers and educators and principals, my executive superintendent and superintendent who really do a lot um, every single day. Um, so a lot of the real priorities that this council has focused on, the extended learning time, I have a real problem with um, on behalf of some of my rise and renewal schools. So I certainly uh, look forward to talking with you about that. And then the breakfast in classrooms, obviously, uh, bridging the gap, social workers. I have a high concentration of students in temporary housing. So anything that focuses on the bus routes and the interagency coordination with DHS is extremely important to me. Uh, along with my colleagues, President Grillo knows very well, we fund everything in our schools because there is no guarantee that the five-year capital and some of the citywide initiatives are really going to get to our schools. So we are funding technology upgrades, upgrades to the cafeteria, the auditorium, the science lab, the playground, everything you can think of. Um, and I, I mentioned other things that you know we've been funding in the district. So I wanted to specifically ask a couple of things. Uh, social workers, guidance counselors, SAPIS workers. Um, you know that there is an increase in the number of suicides among young people, particularly students of color, uh, Latinas and African American. And we've been looking at suicide prevention counselors and talking about that for quite some time. So I wanted to know your thoughts on that as number one. Uh, the Bronx plan, I'm excited. I joined you and the mayor as we launched that. And I wanted to know, in addition to some of the bonuses on teacher salary, some of the citywide initiatives like air conditioning for all, when will that reach some of our schools that are in the Bronx plan in District 9? And then third question, I wanted to ask about PATH, the Intake Center for Homeless Families in the Bronx. There are three educators that are located, DOE staff that are at PATH, and I wanted to find out, would that be an increase? Are they full-time? Because with the number of, of families going in and out of the homelessness system, um, it's really important that DOE has a greater presence at the PATH Center, um, and that's it. 
Try to get it all out in three minutes. Thank you, Chancellor. You, you did a great job. Um, and I, and I want to thank you, uh, Councilmember Gibson. It's always a pleasure to walk schools with you because uh, you know where every device is. You know yes. where every connectivity point is. And you can tell me which If I budget, don't know, they'll tell me. But you can tell me which budget you allocated it from. So I want to thank you uh, for that. So I'll take these in order and I'll ask my colleagues to help um, fill in any gaps. Couldn't agree with you more in terms of trauma-informed um, supports for our students, whether that's curriculum or counselors or social workers as well. Uh, I can tell you that Deputy Chancellor Robinson in her division um, is really focusing on making sure that our counselors are able to provide those kinds of services. We know, for example, how these are all interconnected. So for example, uh, we have talked about why it's important to have an inclusive curriculum. And some people won't understand why it's important to have, for example, LGBTQ and why that curriculum is so important to us. Well, it's important because we know that statistically the students, some of the students that are most at risk are our LGBTQ students. They're most at risk for dropping out. They're most at risk for suicidal ideation. Uh, they're most at risk for being subjects of violence. So we know that if we are not creating an environment where these students see themselves and can be successful in school, which points to the curriculum, but also have the wraparound supports that students need to understand uh, when they have issues or they have challenges, somebody will be there to support them. If they don't know that the adults in the classroom, and I wear this badge, on, on the other side of my ID because I want students to see and I want every adult to know that if you are, uh, have any kind of concerns, I'm an adult, I'm an ally, I, I will listen, I will help. Creating that environment is really important to us. So as we uh, look to add more people, but even aside from adding more people, we wanna make sure that the people we have have the, pr the appropriate training and that we're amplifying their capacity to be able to provide these resources. Uh, so as we're able to get more resources, absolutely, our school wellness and health and human services uh, footprint you're going to see is, is going to grow. Um, and part of that is restorative practices, part of that is our implicit bias training that goes along with that. So we are absolutely on the same path as you are. Um, in terms of the Bronx plan, Yes, there are additional uh, stipends for teachers in hard to staff critical shortage areas. That's very popular. Um, but what also we've uh, very publicly said is that the 60 schools that are currently part of that cohort of Bronx Plan schools, they have already started receiving training so that their collaborative teams are able to do data analysis. Those teams are able then to do a root cause analysis, pick a problem of practice, and then put together a funding plan that will address their pro problem of practice. What we haven't talked a lot about, and I'm glad you asked a question, is that all 60 of those schools, by any definition, have been historically underserved schools. They haven't gotten the stuff and things that others have gotten, including the support. So those schools have now risen to the top of the list. So we are in the final stages of doing walkthroughs in every one of those schools. And not only are we looking at issues of instruction, so do they have technology? Do they have devices? Do they have curriculum? Do they have books? All of those instructional things. But we're also looking at do they have air conditioning? What do the floors look like? What do the facilities look like? Have they been painted? Do they need? So it's a much more comprehensive list of things that we're looking for. And those schools have now gone to the top of the list to get those things. So what we will do is over the course of this summer, we're, we'd be happy to whatever council member has a, a, a school in that's a Bronx plan school, we will meet with you and give you an update on your schools as part of the Bronx plan and what those timelines would look like. Uh, the third question is PATH, and I have to just say I'm not really familiar. Uh, I don't know if my colleagues could talk about PATH, uh, but if not, we can. I can get back to you with a written response there as well. But the, the message is really clear. We need to have a, a bigger presence, correct? Yes. Got I it. need more staff at PATH. Yeah. <laughs> I Thank hear you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. And now we'll go to Council Member Kalos, followed by Joe Knight. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for your advocacy for guidance counselors, psychologists, and social workers in every school. I'd like to echo uh, that request. 
For five years, I've been focused on school seats. That, of course, will continue along with uh, focusing on busing, desegregation, and gifted and talented. I appreciate that we're on track for 1,100 pre-K seats on the Upper East Side, five years following the announcement of pre-K for all. I believe we may have actually finally achieved it. Uh, we are still waiting on a handful of families. Now, on April 24th, 2017, Kate Taylor wrote in the New York Times, quote, New York City will offer free preschool for all three-year-olds. And I quote, Mayor de Blasio announced on Monday that New York City would offer free full-day preschool to all three-year-olds within four years. That was 2017, with full rollout announced for 2021. Your testimony includes adding two additional districts for 14 districts by September 2020. Are you on track to fulfill the mayor's promise for all 32 community school districts by 2021? Uh, we're making headway, council member, but I think that same article also had a line in there that's subject to state and federal funding to help us reach the goal. What is the, su what is the funding shortfall? This is a budget hearing. How much do you need? Yep. I don't have the exact numbers with me, but I'd be happy to get back to you on that. No, I, I need the answer. I've been asked, I, I've asked the mayor for this answer. I've asked Melanie Hartzog for this answer. I've asked your deputy chancellor for this answer. I've asked deputy mayors for this answer. It cannot take three months not to know the answer. I'm looking at the budget. You have about a billion dollars for pre-K. You have about $600 million for child care that includes ACS. Is it safe to assume you need exactly 400 million? We will get back to you with a written response. Today? We will get back to you with a written response. It, it's, been, it's been months. And it, Sir, in terms this is a budget hearing. I understand that, but it's not a game of catch -up. I mean, we'll I'm give, not trying to play catch I, I, I asked I everyone an ahead answer. of time. We will give you an answer. We've said we're going to give you an answer. We very publicly have told you we're going to give you an answer. I, I don't understand. I'm not going to make up a number. We'll, give you, the, we'll give you the you, number you that we anticipate. This, this wasn't my promise. This was the mayor's promise. And I wasn't here in 2017 either. So I will get you an answer, sir. I would like to work with you to make this happen and, and help the mayor keep his promise. Will you help me help the mayor keep his promise? We will help you to help me to help the mayor. <laughs> yes, sir. At the preliminary budget hearing, you indicated that we were planning uh, to be late with your homework on the local law I authored with Speaker Johnson and Chairman Traeger for GPS on buses by September. I understand all the bids are in, how many are in, and do you have any bids that could go live for September, such as ones that I've been suggesting of just using mobile phones and apps like Uber or other ride-sharing service technologies? So we're not going to be late with our homework. We're going to get it right. And I was really clear about the fact that um, the technology is such that if we want to have the robust communication with our families, then we have to do an RFP, and the RFP has certain processes. I'm happy to report that we have nine interested parties that have responded to that RFP. We are now going to the second phase of that process, which is to evaluate them. Uh, and I haven't seen specifically any of the, the, the uh, people that have responded, but I know that uh, if we have nine, that means there's a robust pool. I want to thank the chair for his indulgence on a final question. So Chancellor Carranza, thank you for meeting with the family of a student who was the victim of race-based uh, bullying in a public school in my district. Since then, we've had another incident at another school in my district. I understand the DOE provided initial resources following the incidents to the schools who have now come to me to continue the one-time funding. Will DOE baseline funding for social emotional learning uh, through positive learning collaborate at schools in my district, starting with those that experience race related bullying? Uh, and then on the similar topic of just race relations, will you invest in public private partnerships for schools, uh, including rolling out honors programs and gifted and talented programs to desegregate? Uh, and uh, just I, I overheard you, you visited uh, one of my colleagues, and um, I'm now jealous of Vanessa Gibson. I would love for you to come to a school in my district, or at least as many as we could squeeze in, uh, to tour my schools, because I'm not sure you've made it to my district yet. Thank you, sir. Actually, I've spent time in your district, um, just not with you. So let's, let's make it a date. 
let's make it a date. Um, so we are very committed to wraparound services and especially services. It was an honor to meet with uh, the student and his parents, as you mentioned. Um, and it's absolutely unacceptable. I think when you look at what's happening in our city and the incidences of racial animus uh, with uh, swastikas being put up, with uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters being attacked on the street, there is a climate that is manifesting itself, which quite frankly, I think, uh, comes from some of, the, some of the rhetoric coming from the federal level. Um, and we're seeing it right now in New York City, and because schools are microcosms of society, unfortunately, we see that in our schools. We will continue to take that very seriously. We will uh, allocate the appropriate resources and support people to help with students, and we are always looking to build our private-public partnerships, um, especially around issues of being able to provide wraparound student support services. Uh, so we're very concerned about it as well as I know the council is, um, but we are also working diligently to make sure that as these unfortunate things happen, we have a just-in-time response uh, to the families and students to repair that harm. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Joe and I followed by Powers. Thank you, Chair. So, Chancellor, um, I have a question that I hope that you'll be open and honest, that I know that you can be, uh, because it's on the minds of all of us. Um, it's a number that you should know, and I hope that you'll share with us. How much weight did you lose since you became Chancellor? <laughs> Let me get to the real questions, and hopefully... I'm ready to answer it, if you want. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. You're right. Answer the question. Yes, sir. Uh, so thank you for noticing. Uh, I, I am now down 73 pounds. 73 pounds. 73 pounds. I'm running um, every week now probably about 17 miles. I was going to do the Brooklyn half, but I had events, couldn't do it. And my favorite color is blue, and I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> now that I got the softball out of the way, can we begin with a real question? And, include, and it's very difficult to be, not to sound angry, when it's matters of passion and education and I'm a numbers guy like yourself I look at the school system 1.1 million children I think now the budget's 27 billion it's about 25,000 per student the highest in the country our children should not be going without anything at those numbers we should have the best of the best one school trailers I've often spoken to you about this. We're not moving fast enough. This is the tale of two students. And it truly is a, a disservice to the environment that those children are placed in, and some of them are death traps. Secondly, safety plans. There's a safety committee meetings are not taken seriously. They're not taking place adequately with the appropriate representatives of both parents, students, and teachers. The meetings are minimized and not taken seriously. The minutes are not being provided to the entire staff. And it's not transparent. This is not a matter which, is a, which can be taken lightly. And there's plenty of blame to go around, but we know there's an issue here. And unfortunately, this is going to fall on your shoulders. And I'll get back to that as well. Um, Talking about early voting and the impact that using public schools uh, for polling sites. We just heard from a hearing that over a course of eight months, there could be potential 50 days of voting that can be taking place in our schools. That's taken away lunchrooms, gyms, and a variety of other common areas. What are we going to do to address that? What are we going to do to... Con One of the issues that were also brought up is the lack of poll workers. And one of the possible solutions that I brought up was allowing our students, our high school students, to use community service hours to man these stations and be paid. 
It's a win-win, and we engage them in the voting process. Bronx plan, question number four. I'm keeping track. I hope you are. Thank you. One of the issues that I brought to your attention to induce that we have the best teachers and those that are teaching in the Bronx schools remain here was a simple solution. Parking placards. One of their issues, I can't teach in the borough of the Bronx. I have no place to park. I'm tired of getting tickets and there's no transportation options for me. It doesn't work. Fifth, um, cuts their emotions. Cuts, but the threat of cuts to programs and after school programs and sports. We get our parents engaged, we get our children engaged, and it becomes a groundhog, a, a groundhog day scenario. Every year, every budget, same issues. We threaten to take away, then we put back, and we play on the emotions of everyone. And meanwhile, we're not addressing the real issues that we should never be talking about cuts to begin with. Question number six, ACs, not only for classrooms, but for gyms and lunchrooms. Shelter students, we have so many of our students that need proper care in the classroom outside of the school hours, including social workers. The borough of the Bronx has more than its fair share citywide. And my last question that I hope that you'll answer is we need to educate our children early. And I mean not only in the, on subjects of math and reading, but also on opioids, when should you use, use an emergency room and what not to. We see there's a big problem now and the system is broken. Let's not continue to focus on repairing the damage that is now solely and invest on the future. And that is, let's educate our children. Let's let them know and go back to the old way of doing things, whether it be scared straight or give them all the information that they possibly need so they don't make the wrong choices in life. So we stop making excuses for them when they do make the wrong choices because we're the ones to blame and we're not doing our part. And DOE should be working with DOH to educate our children. They're sponges. They'll take home that information and provide it to their parents. Thank you. So um, I might take these in a little out of order. So trailers, uh, portable classrooms. We sometimes refer to them as learning cottages. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask President Grillo sure. to, to uh, give some updates on that. Sure. Uh, and we do have updates, actually. Uh, when we began under this administration, there were over 350 trailers uh, in the system. Uh, we have removed over 200 of them. We have plans for another 70-some-odd. 70, 70 but finally, we are looking for alternatives for what the remainder, which are 74 of those trailers. now. Many of those trailers contain students. And in order for us to remove these trailers, we have to find alternative space for those students. That is, th that is the difficulty, that is what we face, but we're working very, very hard on that, and we have reduced that number significantly over the last five years. Safety plans, uh, couldn't agree with you more. Safety plans are a matter of life and death, I think if you uh, if anyone is paying attention to what's happened across the country, um, it is incredibly important that we have plans that are taken seriously and that those plans are adhered to. Uh, we work very closely with our, our colleagues in the NYPD, uh, but what you shared with me, Councilman, I'm going to take back to my staff to make sure that we have some expectations clearly in place for how those meetings should take place and what should happen uh, as a result of those meetings. Uh, the Bronx plan parking placards. So, sorry, which includes stakeholders because it's yes. student, parents, teachers, staff, NYPD, law enforcement, they all have to partake in these right. conversations and they have to be taken seriously, and that which means follow-up and transparency. Noted. Um, Bronx parking plan placards. I remember that conversation you and I had. Uh, you think segregation is an important topic? You think integration is a talk as soon as I started asking about parking placards my goodness uh, but we've started the process of inquiring what would it take for a parking placard program uh, to target very specific schools uh, in uh, boroughs where parking is an issue and there are underserved communities underserved students so we've started that that initial conversation we can update you as soon as we have a little more information on that 
Um, I'm interested. What was the feedback? Obviously, there's pushback in this administration. I, I wouldn't say that it's pushback in the administration. I think it's a topic that, depending on who you talk to, they have a different opinion about whether or not there should be parking placards, whether they're used appropriately or inappropriately, where have they been used, where have they not been used. I mean, it's talk, talk about a Pandora's box. But we're having the conversation because I do agree. Whatever we can do to support teachers, uh, if we can make it so that teachers can teach and be Let's just, let's, let's just say it this way. If teachers have the least amount of obstacles in serving our students in some of our most historically underserved communities, the better. I agree with you, and I'm, I truly am passionate and I believe in you. I just believe your hands are tied. And the politics Remember, of it let's let is what I'm pushing back. Up. So um, also in terms of um, voting and using schools as polling sites. Um, our intergovernmental team is working on that particular issue as well as I think there's also been legislation recently proposed at the state level, um, if, if I'm correct. But again, I wanna make sure there's the least amount of interruptions in our schools. And if polling, I've seen it in a number of places, if polling can be conducted without um, disrupting a school function, that's one thing. But when you have pieces of buildings that are in some cases co-locations, in some cases are very impacted, uh, and it's disrupting the school day, I agree, that should not be happening. And as I mentioned, we are diving into that particular issue as well. Um, and then um, opioids and early education and as early as possible. So as part of our uh, health curriculum, the commissioner of the Department of Health and I um, have just met again on what should that curriculum look like, what are areas and gaps in the curriculum, um, and we're working on a number of issues, uh, really strengthening our partnership with the Department of Health and the DOE. I agree with you, the earlier that we're able to, as part of the educational process, give students the information they need to be healthy, um, the better. And that's really part of the conversation, not only illegal drugs, opioids, but also issues around uh, diabetes and good nutrition and um, high blood pressure and a, a lot of things that if students have good knowledge from, the, from their early years, they can actually start building healthy minds but healthy bodies. Hey, Thank you, sir. Good, let's go now to Councilmember Power, Powers followed by Barron. Great, thank you. And I just want to share, I, I agree with Councilmember Joe and I on the um, using, you know, the ability of using high school students as, um, as poll workers yes. where possible. I don't know if that requires a change of state law, but I think it's a good idea and I agree with him on that. Um, the new five-year uh, capital plan has a new capacity for uh, you know, roughly 58,000 seats. It has five new schools in Manhattan. Can you share the locations of the schools in Manhattan? Uh, council member, the, the sites have not yet been identified. We can certainly get to the districts where the, the seat need is. Uh, yeah, it still looks like District 2 has the highest yes, school need, so I believe we can so. assume that there'll be one. <clears throat> I, okay. And, and do we have an expectation about when those might come online? Again, the goal is to get them done, to get them at least uh, identified and designed um, in this cap the new capital plan. Okay, great. And and there's an issue. I just want to, one of the reasons I w want to ask that as well is there's an issue in my district um, where where I live in Stuyvesant Town. It is divided between District One and District Two, and so you have new parents move in and find out that their next door or their you know their adjacent building is sending their kids to one school. They have to go to another. The admissions process in District One, District Two differently. Kids are getting ended up. Um, you know, far from home, not with their, you know, not with their neighbors. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're unhappy about that. But, you know, I've asked and I would continue to ask that um, cause, because it, this will need, there will be a need for increasing capacity in District 2, that if we can add that and then look at potentially, you know, revising those school lines, I know that's a difficult thing to do, or looking at the admissions so that you don't have kids who are growing up right next to each other who are expecting to go to school together and parents feel sort of fooled by that whole process. And council member, we would appreciate any help you can give in identifying sites in that area. You have my, you have my support <laughs> in that. Um, back to the question around school breakfast, um, uh, you know, 
Can you just explain, there's 500, I think, 80-something sites you mentioned that are doing breakfast at the classroom today, and I think you said maybe it was 1,800 schools total. Can you tell us how those schools, those 580, how does that, how do those schools be, are chosen, qualified, how do they become, you know, how are they able to do it, and then why is it only 580 out of 1,800, if those numbers are correct? Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the opportunity to clarify um, our statements earlier. So uh, the Breakfast in the Classroom is rolled out in the K-8 to grades, so it's only in those schools, which makes the subset of the schools that are eligible smaller than the total whole in our districts, one of 32 schools. And so um, there are 800 schools approximately that we're planning to get breakfast in the classroom. And again, um, more than 520, around 525 of them have it as of this month. 525 out of 800 that are Correct. eligible. And they're K to eight, meaning they're not, they're not middle, they're not six to eight, they're I believe I, it's any school that has a K to eight. Okay, okay, got it. And what are the other and what are the other schools doing? They're doing it not in the classroom, they're doing it before school. So all schools per state law have to have breakfast in the cafeteria before the bell. And so all schools that do not have the breakfast in the classroom model do continue to provide breakfast in their cafeteria. And this is by this is the choice of the principal to do this? I think that we're revisiting how we roll out that program as part of the savings initiative, but we have been rolling out the Breakfast in the Classroom program over the last couple of years based on where we saw the needs for it greatest. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, it's there, it, it takes some time to set up the program in terms of um, adding additional refrigeration units that might require electrical upgrades in schools and so on. And so um, depending on your school size, it has been a little bit of work to get it off the ground. Got it. And just two more questions. I'm sorry for taking more time. Um, what is there? Is there any data on participation rate if you are uh, before if you're a school that's before the school day versus uh, before the school day versus in the classroom? Yes, we have data, and I, I gave two examples of schools that are not breakfast in the classroom schools that have remarkably high participation rates, but we can get you a full listing uh, of, of, of that data. Okay, that'd be, that'd be helpful. And my last question, um, and Councilmember Borelli is in here, and I think the school's actually in Councilmember Matteo's district, but there's a school in, in, in Matteo's district, in I think it's called Wagner Middle School, Susan Wagner Middle School, perhaps. Susan Wagner, oh, you know, hey, we have another stand on. Um, it was reported that 9, 9, 8.58 a.m. or 9 a.m. is when lunch starts there. And I know Councilor Adams had asked a question earlier about early lunch. 9 a.m. for starting lunchtime is inexplainable, uh, especially when we're talking about this, the questions around food access. Can you, can you confirm if that's still the, the, um, the time that that school or other schools are starting lunchtime? Yeah, what we'll do is we'll we'll get back to you specifically with that school. I want to I want to make sure, as I said, we're looking at all of our schools, not only the start times, but we're also looking at when their lunch times are. Uh, 9 a.m. is great for breakfast. Um, I don't even eat breakfast before. Right. You know. But not for lunch. So right. that right. that is a concern of ours as well. So we will specifically get back to you on this particular school but we should also be able to give you um, kind of a running total of all of our schools. And That'd be great. I'd like to know the schools in my district particularly. Thank you. Thank you to the chairs. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Councilmember, for that question because I, I'm pretty sure I, I had a bill that actually looked at trying to push the start times, particularly in the high schools, where, you know, I used to teach a 7.30 in the morning regions class, and that was not very conducive to learning when... Many kids had issues with sleeping and, and, and getting to school on time. Um, and so I think that there's a correlation with regards to some extremely early school start times and when they are serving lunch or at an inappropriate time that we should be, you know, we need to kind of normalize this for students and staff. So I, I thank you for raising the issue. Next. Thank you. Councilmember Barron, followed by Salamanca. Oh, let me also say we were joined by Councilmembers Cohen, Salamanca, Rosenthal, Rose, Barron, and Cornegy. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you to the chairs for hosting this hearing, and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, we're so glad that you're here to answer our questions. We talked about the removal of TCUs, and we're so pleased that uh, we had the groundbreaking for uh, the new home for the East New York Family Academy, which previously had six portables that were fully used as a part of the program, and classrooms that were perhaps 20 feet by 30 feet 
uh, just really small room, so we're looking forward to that. And I'll let you know if I still need you to come and get your pick and shovel, okay. But we still have two schools that are not used, that have portables that are not used for instruction. Because I heard you say that part of the reason for the delay was some of these portables are used. So uh, PS202 in District 19 has four portables in their yard, which I don't believe are being used for instruction. So will that move them up in the timetable to have them removed? And while we're looking at that, this past weekend, District 19 had their STEM Lipics, and the elementary, the middle schools and elementary schools as well had projects which were, which were entered into the Olympic competition to see how well the bridges that they constructed could withstand the pressure that was applied by a very scientific machine that they had purchased, as well as creating launches and having them have targets which they were to meet. It was very exciting. It was, the children were greatly motivated. Parents were there as well, and of course the teachers. So in terms of technology, how can we make sure that the computers that students are using are up to date? Because as I visited my schools, some of these computers are 10 years old, and in technology, that's very old. And I want to commend Dr. McBride, the superintendent, for the position, uh, for the emphasis that he's putting on that program. And the curriculum that we talk about, oh, back to the East New York Family Academy, which is being built and completed for opening by 2021, I still want to talk about how we can utilize the roof of the building so that it can be more accessible and can be incorporated. Green roof, you know, we can get up there, so that's an issue that I will still want to talk about. And in terms of the teachers, I have a new school which has, I believe, 60 students and has, I believe, three teachers or four teachers. So as an administrator, you know that that's a challenge. And there are teachers who are not certified in math and science, and that's a question that I often bring up. Do we still have teachers teaching math and science in middle school levels that are not state certified? Because I know in this particular school they're not. So how pervasive is that when we're talking about boosting our students' performance that we don't have teachers who are certified and what can we do to address that? Uh, and to my colleagues who talked about student poll workers, there is a provision in the Board of Elections for a student to be assigned at many of the polling sites. So I would encourage you to check that out and find out how you can utilize that. And lastly, the curriculum that we talk about, uh, we talk about implicit bias. How are we making sure that that curriculum is being implemented in a way that's aggressive and that lets teachers know we need for them to really be mindful of projecting what it is that we need to do to address those issues that our students are facing. And then, of course, if you have some time, you can talk about uh, the plan to remove and eliminate the specialized tests for high schools. So thank you, um, Councilmember Barron. So I'm going to ask uh, President Grillo if she can take on the TCU question first, and then sure. I'll take on the rest. Sure. Actually, Councilmember, um, as you know, when we remove TCUs, we, we typically, uh, if we're not building new, we're certainly building a new playground space for the students. In this particular case at 202, that project is currently in design. So that will, should go into construction shortly. So if I forget any of the questions, I think I got them down, just remind me. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we, I sent a note to my staff, we're gonna look into this issue of credential teachers at the middle school level and get you specific numbers. I also am very concerned that we would have, especially in STEAM um, fields, uh, non-credential teachers for that particular area. I, I can tell you that um, because it's not on my critical issues radar, uh, I don't anticipate that's going to be a significant number, but even one is too many. So we'll, we'll get back to you uh, very specifically on that. The other issue around implicit bias training, um, how do we ensure that it's being taken seriously, but that it's actually um, it, it's permeating what happens in our, in our classrooms? 
Um, first and foremost, I can tell you that I have been very impressed with the approach that uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson and her team have taken in terms of structuring an implicit bias. It's not a workshop. It's actually, uh, it's a five-part series. Uh, eventually, people will go through all five um, rounds of, of doing this. So the very fact that as an educator, you remember the drive-by professional development really is worthless. Um, it's not like you come and you get an injection and you're cured. Um, so it really is about grappling with who you are and how you project your opinions, your thoughts, your values onto others who may have different thoughts and, and, and backgrounds. So I can tell you, having participated in several of these sessions, they are emotionally tough sessions. And people confront what they didn't perceive was a bias, and all of a sudden, as they go through the process of understanding and listening to others and looking and being reflective, they come to realize that maybe I do have biases that I didn't think I had, but I'm not that kind of person. But it's not about you being any kind of person, it's about understanding who you are. So I can tell you firsthand that it is very impactful, and I've seen uh, some very difficult conversations happen during those trainings. But we don't just let people there and, and let them deal with it. There's follow-up sessions. So as I mentioned, five follow-up sessions. Uh, we are also being very thoughtful so that it's not just teachers, but it's everyone that touches the lives of a child. So it's principals, it's superintendents, it's uh, directors and executive directors, it's um, support staff at school as well. So as we're building the coalition of trained staffers, uh, then it becomes part of everything we do. Uh, it becomes part of the evaluation process, it becomes part of a referral process for students, it becomes part of every system and structure and data that we track. Uh, we're looking for the disproportionality and seeing are there areas that we need to intervene. So we're early in that process, but uh, as I've mentioned, I'm very excited about uh, the approach that we're taking. Um, and quite frankly, it's one of the areas where uh, I would very much welcome the support of uh, the council in, in, in securing resources for uh, making that approach uh, be even more robust as we go forward. Um, I know I'm forgetting one of your questions. Uh, technology. Technology. Thank you, Council Member Barron, for that question. So. Uh, you may remember the Smart Schools Bond Act funding that was launched um, uh, by the governor several years ago. Our technology plan was approved at the end of 2018, and so we anticipate rolling that out that will uh, this fall. That will provide $106 million for uh, equipment and devices in schools. Uh, we're rolling that out starting with the Bronx Plan schools and also looking at other areas of high economic need. So there is good news coming um, to schools with uh, with a need for devices. So how will the other schools beyond the Bronx Plan schools be determined? Because you know, we don't always get equity in terms of distribution of money. Understood. So we, uh, all schools are entitled to funding under the Smart Schools Bond Act. There is a base per capita for each uh, pupil in their schools. Um, and, and all schools will receive some funding of, to support devices. Again, we're looking at um, the needs of schools. We're looking at one of the intents of the Smart Schools Bond Act was to support online testing. So schools that have grades um, in those testing years will receive funding to support those types of um, needs as well. Councilmember Barron, I, I would also underscore that one of the goals that we've articulated is advancing equity now. This is an example of what we mean. So uh, all schools, as it pertains to the allocation of resources, as it pertains to devices, we, we, I have directed that we apply an equity lens. And very simply, who, who and what are those communities that have not been resourced historically? And they need to go first. Uh, because we know that uh, traditionally in those kinds of neighborhoods, you have students and communities that have s significant obstacles, challenges, um, and we, from an equity perspective, need to be clear that they have the supports, the technology, the devices, anything you can think of that they need to help meet the needs so that students are able to achieve. So equity means they're gonna go first, and that means from every particular perspective. And Mr. Chair, if I could, 
Uh, just a brief summary about the need for removing the specialized test for high schools. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Councilman Barron. I'm not sure I've been really clear about my position on this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I will try to summarize as quickly as I can. Uh, there is no educational research that I'm aware of that supports a single test as the sole criteria for identifying student talent to go into a specialized environment. Um, there is none. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a messaging issue in that we ask students and parents, but particularly at the middle school level, go to school every day, do well in school, don't get in trouble, uh, do well in your English, math, social studies, science class, uh, play a sport, take up an instrument, have a hobby, be part of an award-winning debate team. None of that matters if you want to go to a specialized school because you have to take one test that's multiple choice that's not aligned to the state standards so everything they're studying in school has nothing to do with the test they have to take for an opportunity to go to a public school in New York City called a specialized school. So there's a mismatch in terms of what we said to students they need to do and then how they actually have access uh, to opportunities to go to these schools. In addition, um, because we believe that in New York City we should be able to make decisions in New York City regarding our schools, uh, we have the added um, problem that we have a state law that dictates to New Yorkers what the admissions process should be for this set of schools. Um, as I've done my homework and try to figure out what happened with that state law, there was very little public input when it was enacted in 1971. And my perspective, based on the documents that were read into the record at the time and the documentation since then, uh, it was a direct response to the efforts of the chancellor at that time, Chancellor Scribner and the Board of Education, to actually find ways to uh, integrate the three specialized schools in existence at the time. Uh, so in my mind, the intent was really to stop the integration of these schools, and it's now codified into state law. And wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a repeal to that state law that would allow us in New York to determine what it looks like to admit students into those schools? The, the final point that I would make in this, in this area is that this is not an, uh, an effort to disadvantage anyone or to overly advantage anyone. The admissions to those schools and the seats at those schools belong to the people of New York City. And if you look at the 1.1 million students that are attending schools uh, in New York City, 70% of the students are black and Latino students. So when we look at this year's admissions class to Stuyvesant High School, where seven black students have an offer and less than 12 Latino students have been made an offer. They come nowhere near reflecting the diversity of the students in New York City. So either we believe it's the students or we should be looking at what are the system structures, policies, practices, laws that advantage some and disadvantage others. How did I do? That's my summation. That's an A plus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Salamanca followed by Rosenthal. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, Chancellor, it's great seeing you. I um, want to start, of course, by applauding you on speaking up on school segregation in our school system. Even though it's a difficult conversation to have in certain parts of the city, I applaud you and thank you for that. Um, Chancellor, I have a few questions. I want to stay within my time frame. Uh, so if you can just give me very direct answers. Are there any plans to increase funding for, aut for the autism charter school? You know, they have not gotten an increase in the last couple of years. We, uh, we have been in, thank you for the question, council member. We've been in dialogue with the Autism Charter School uh, and with the state and with OMB to understand the problem and to see if there's anything we can do. The current structure hasn't been updated in uh, many years, it's true. Um, however, we also have not been able to identify thus far how we would fund an increase. Are there any um, public schools that deal with uh, children with autism? Yes, there are. How many are there in the Bronx? Uh, I would actually have to get that number for you. I, I do know there are okay. ASD NEST programs in the Bronx. Chancellor, the issue that we're having is that there are not many options in the city of New York, and there are not many options in my district. 
And I do have a autism charter school in my district. I went to visit them uh, a few weeks ago. I was impressed by the work that they're doing. And it was heartbreaking to know that they have not received funding in over, an increase in their funding in over five years. Um, and I think that that needs to be addressed. Um, going to very quickly, uh, uh, my bill on Narcan, uh, having Narcan available in all 1800 public schools, has there been any progress with that? I know that we've been working very closely with staff around that particular bill. We, we have some areas that we're working with our labor partners on, um, but we're, we're supportive of supporting the safety and health of students, and we'll okay. continue to work with you on that. All right. Um, my last two questions. My, uh, my four-year-old goes to universal pre-K, um, and if something, you know, I, I'm always critical of the mayor, is something I want to give him credit on is this UPK program. It's an excellent program. My constituents love it. My wife and I really love it. My son, he's, uh, he's lactose intolerant. And therefore, every day, um, we have to send him with his own lactic milk to school. And lactic milk is expensive. Um, I can afford it, but I have many of my constituents who are going, their children are lactic um, you know, uh, intolerable, and uh, they cannot afford this type of lactic milk. Um, I have a resolution that would make uh, milk have an alternative for uh, lactate intolerance in public schools, and basically having that milk available for children. Is the Department of Education looking into uh, something like this, you know, uh, now, rather than waiting for a resolution to be passed? Yeah, so th thank you for your resolution. I actually look forward to uh, getting up to speed on the resolution, but I, I referenced earlier in my testimony that uh, the director of the Department of Health and I have been meeting regularly around a number of issues having to do with health in the schools. Uh, student nutrition and milk and what kinds of milk is actually one of the areas that we are working together on. So we are actively looking at that issue. And as I get your bill and I have staff um, kind of dive into that, I look forward to talking to you more about what that would look like. All right, then my last question is, I know that there's been conversations about, and there was an article, hundreds of school cafeterias flunk city health inspections. And um, I've introduced a bill, uh, and I'm, I'm working with the chair to get a hearing on it, which would require every public school to post a letter grade of their inspections of the cafeteria on, in front of their cafeteria and in the entrance of the schools. Um, something very similar to restaurants and food carts. You know, um, parents should know, you know, if, if these uh, cafeterias are failing our kids, if they're not failing our kids, uh, and, and I think that these, uh, these uh, reports should be available to the public uh, easily. Uh, is this something that you think I would get resistance from the Department of Education when we get a hearing? I, I look forward to seeing what that looks like. Um, and, you know, schools, as long as it's everybody, private, public, everybody. Um, that would be one of the things that I would want to be looking for. But I, again, I want to see the, the resolution and then uh, happy to engage in, in a conversation about what that would look like. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sir. Chair. Thank you very much. Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Amphrey Samuel. Thank you so much, Chair. It's Chancellor, always great to see you. President and com Commissioner, always great to see you uh, and, and to your team. Um, first, I want to ask about um, diversity in schools. Chancellor, you wrote a great op-ed for the Daily News, I think it was last week. Um, I was uh, disappointed to see, though, that there were no calls for diversity for people with disabilities. Um, you know, I have a close colleague who went to school who has a physical disability went to Bronx Tech, there was only one other student with a physical disability at the time. Um, I'm, so I'm wondering where you are and, and perhaps um, President Grillo can also feed into that with making our schools accessible. Um, but have you allocated, we noticed there was no investment for diversity and in integration uh, in the executive budget, that was something the council had called for. It was something the school diversity advisory group had called for. I wondered what your plans are for funding um, all types of integration in the schools. And then 
cor uh, corollary of that in my mind's eye is wherever we can find savings in the budget, we should because then we have money for the things like this that are so important. I'm wondering, uh, all the city agencies were asked for cuts. I'm wondering if SCA was asked for savings or efficiencies. I'm wondering if um, you have found um, that at DDC, if they have any, you know, insights about construction um, efficiencies that you could bring back to the SCA. I know you're going back and forth and bringing best practices to both places. Um, and if there are, in your mind's eye, there are any um, sort of best practices for um, measures of efficiencies in contracts, whether it's cost per, per square foot, change orders, uh, comparisons to the private sector, et cetera. And lastly, um, just whether or not you've considered baselining teacher's choice, uh, which is also important to me. So wrapping it all up with that. So council member, um, I'm happy to go through some of the issues that you raised in terms of efficiencies and in terms of best practices. I will say this, um, SEA's cost per square foot is um, a fraction of other agencies in terms of uh, per square foot cost. So the efficiencies will go from SCA to other agencies along the way. Um, part of that though, and, and um, I brought this up before to the city council, our procurement process, um, I, again, SCA is an authority, so we have some flexibilities that other agencies do not have. The procurement process can be endless. And I will say this, you mentioned the word change orders. A change order could literally take nine months to a year to get approval. Now that may not seem like much, but if you're a small minority contractor who has bills to pay, you could literally go out of business. So someday I would love to have a conversation about procurement reform and how we can make it work for everyone. In Thing, this is a reality in the SCA. No, this is a reality in city agencies. Thank you. Yes, but the reality of SCA is we have some advantages that others don't, and that's why we're able to produce and to produce much more efficiently. Uh, in terms of um, uh, accessibility, uh, as you know, in this uh, proposed capital plan, we are proposing $750 million, the largest investment ever made um, in accessibility upgrades through our schools. The goal here is to have 50% of our schools at least partially or fully accessible, and at least one third of our schools fully accessible. So we have options for, for those students that um, have the need. Could you send along, I, I don't know if you have an explicit plan for that sort of by school or, or also type of disability? I'm wondering sure. if you're gonna include hearing loops, for right, example. Right now, so you know, there is an accessibility um, subcommittee that's made up of the SCA, Division of School Facilities, Space Management, uh, Office of Student Enrollment, Specialized Instructions, and the General Counsel's Legal Office. And the goal is to really work to identify the project, specific project, and make sure that we ensure equity across the district. So um, that group will meet and continues to meet regularly to prioritize <clears throat> the project. And I would ask uh, if you would consider including the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities in your working group. They have some spectacular do. Uh, people Absolutely. who really, thank you, I appreciate Absolutely. that. Um, Councilman Rosenthal, I would only add to what President Grillo so eloquently stated is that this year we also implemented a priority for students with disabilities in the selection of their schools. So a student with a disability, as noted in their IEP, gets priority for schools that are accessible. So they go to the top of the list. Um, so again, we're trying to look at everything we're doing in making sure that we're not being an obstacle to students. I think it would mean the world to the disabilities community for you to include that in your op-eds, in your talking points about this. Um, you know, there's a large group of people who feel left out. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. We've also been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez. Now we're going to have questions by Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, followed by Rodriguez, and then we're going to uh, have one from Councilmember Rose. Good afternoon, Chancellor and everyone else. Um, I was listening to the exchange a little while ago um, with Councilmember Kalos about the public-private partnerships, and it made me think about other opportunities for students via the career and technical um, education schools, and you know, just also reading through your testimony when you talked about um, you know just opportunities through college preparedness, college access, and knowing that some of our students are not on that particular track. Um, with the partnership for NYC and CYE, DOE created the CTE Industry Scholars Model, which launched in 2017, and students get a professional internship working with the MTA and JP Morgan and Con Ed. To my knowledge, there is currently no funding identified to continue the program beyond this summer when the current three-year contract ends. So can you just speak a little bit to um, DOE supporting this, the, you know, continuing these types of programs and specifically the CTE industry scholars and are there any plans to scale up? So thank you for the question. I, I want to reiterate, you are absolutely right. So a one size does not fit all, especially with students as they're developing what their areas of interest are going forward. Uh, specifically about the program that you mentioned, we have a note and I'll follow up with you specifically about what plans are there are, there are for that program. But I will tell you as a rule, I am a huge supporter of our CTE programs and our differentiated approach to providing um, not only internships but externships and paid internships for our, for our students. Uh, I've recently met with uh, some CEOs in the financial industry who are on board with helping us develop an, an apprenticeship model in a number of areas in our schools. Uh, they're not only willing to come to the table with obviously support, financial support, but they're, they're talking about creating uh, jobs in their organizations that our students would then have paid internships for. Huge public-private partnership opportunities for us in that spot. Uh, I recently attended, uh, had an opportunity to visit a school on Governor's Island, which is preparing students for uh, water-based careers. I didn't know what I was gonna see, but it blew my mind because you had students there that are gonna be able to walk out of high school earning close to six figures, and they're gonna be able to navigate ships. They are, there are students that are designing um, the, the, the containers and they're welding them, and they're part of the Billion uh, Oyster Project, and they're putting oysters into the water surrounding New York City, and they're able to technically write about this while still loving the welding that they're doing. I've seen students at Aviation High School that are getting this incredible experience. So I, I think it's a big opportunity that students have multiple ways of being able to connect with what their talents are. Uh, we are also in conversations and working closely with the, the unions in the city uh, so that we create apprenticeship programs and pathways for students in that regard. So a big supporter, uh, I can tell you that we will not cut those programs. If anything, we're looking at how do we continue to grow those programs. Okay, so thank you. I look forward to that follow-up. And Chancellor, we still need to move forward with trying to connect in my district because I know we've canceled a few times. Yep between our offices, so. We will make it happen. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Rodriguez. Good afternoon, Chancellor. I, I think that the most difficult piece is that we know the city has not been lacking ideas. The question is how those ideas been dealing with so many challenges. And no, I'm not gonna be asking the pool at George Washington, I'm not gonna be asking about the other project that I have in my community. I hope that, you know, with the school construction, the designing thing is moving ahead. I'm not gonna be referring to the Mechatronic School. I know that we have a meeting and we talk about how we need to put a team together to start the process to create that school that is part of the rezoning agreement. However, you just mentioned something, you know, the Governor's Island, the school there by the Harbor Foundation. 
I can give you a typical example. The Harvard Foundation was interested to create a new school. We visited that school. We identified one side, PS5, close to the water and diagram. Harvard Foundation say we would like to turn the school as a Harvard school. DOE has zero interest on in moving with the plan. And we're talking about, I can tell you because my near neighbor is one of those who grad now in June. And without we having knowledge at that school, that's key we're not be planning today to go to a college that focus on bioengineering. So the question is how we have to continue pushing the envelope. Because look, it's so sad to see how we should at a White House in here in our city where people, they are not showing the color. They are not into like sharing the privilege. A school that raised half a million dollars is a model for any other school in the city. But how can we invest in those? How do we use poverty in the formula to put most resources in those schools that they don't have the same resources? And for me, one of those areas that is more critical is the elementary school. How, and if you have the number, that for me, one of the question is, when a student moves from elementary to middle school, what percentage as today, they are reading, writing, and doing math to their level? And because of the amount of time, if you have the number, I would like to know what the number is so that I can have a chance to ask another question. Do we have that number specifically? So you want to know the percentage of students that are reading at grade level as a transition from elementary school to middle school across the city? Yeah, yeah. yeah we can get you that number. Look, and that's a critical one because it's like, you know, here we have a vision, a goal for, let's say, vision zero. We have a goal for con a, a, a pollution in our city. And unless we have a goal and we've been able to establish how were we doing 10 years ago? And of course, we're doing better. And don't take me wrong, no one in any other administration had done the UPK, algebra for all, computer for all. Those are good things. But unless we have the numbers in front of us, and all leaders, mm -hmm. from teachers, superintendents, borough directors, and you, mm -hmm. say here, you know, we were on whatever 50% of the students reading in the, in the level. And that number today has been reduced to what improved to this number. Those numbers should be the guidance. Sure. And for me, that's one of the key pieces about, like the UPK, you know, I put a, a language for a, 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 resol a, a bill that I would like to see the DOE also providing a report to us on what is the result. Where are those students going from UPK? Which are the kindergarten that they're going? Which middle school they're going? Because let me tell you, the middle class parents, we know that that's our goal. Mm -hmm. We know that all of us who now being joined the middle class community, we have kids in middle school, we know that we would like to see kids in their level. So I would like to get that information and finally provide after school program to all elementary school. Because if we want to tackle inequality, the middle class family, they all have after school program for the children. We all invest in that. And I think that as we have made progress in other area, today I would like to know what is our plan to provide to make mandatory after school program for all middle school. So Councilman Rodriguez, uh, agree with, with everything you just said. Um, and as an educator, I know you understand how, how important that is in our schools. Um, apropos to my earlier testimony, one, one of the many reasons that I am very thankful to this council and the leadership in this council, uh, is, is especially our chairs, has been this, uh, I would say, negligence of funding that has happened from the state of New York. They owe our children $1.2 billion dollars and where people will say, well, you know, you can't just throw money at the issue. Just one time in my 30 years <laughs> as an educator, I wish they would have thrown money at the issue. They're still not funding. And, and this becomes 
egregious in our historically underserved communities where you don't have the resources to do the after school programs. Unless you have uh, a community school and you have a CBO and there's a private money that's been raised and uh, after school enrichment programs should not be in addition to, they should be part of funding schools and we can only do that if we have the funding. Now this city council and this administration has stepped up. Over the last, over the course of this administration, four billion dollars in additional funding has been invested in the public schools in New York City. I don't think anyone can say this council or this administration hasn't stepped up. It's time for the state of New York to step up uh, and allow us to provide those kinds of wraparound services, those kinds of enrichment programs, those kinds of differentiated kind of programs in our community. So uh, I agree with you and part of the plan is our continued advocacy in Albany. Uh, and I echo what Chairman Traeger said, no one should be taking a victory lap around school funding in Albany. Uh, there is still much work to be done, and the real effects are felt in our neighborhoods, uh, as you've very eloquently stated. I, Chairman, if you don't mind, 30 seconds. Chancellor, we have to disagree. We cannot wait for Albany in order for the city of New York to make after school program mandatory for our children, because that's inequality. Middle class, a school, that has a PTA, that can raise half a million dollars, a million dollars, they have after school program. I understand what, we, what you're saying, and we've been fighting with this administration, but it's like we're saying that we're gonna be ending, having the most segregated education system hour when Albany makes change the rule, you know, is unacceptable. Providing after school programs to all elementary school no particular programs, not the council fighting together. This is not a, a issue of we blaming Albany. This is we, the administration, must finally, for one day, provide after school program because the middle and upper middle class family, they have after school programs. Okay. Uh, council Member Rose, I, I have, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I have to go to a briefing and then I have hearings this afternoon as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Traeger to do the follow-up with Chancellor and uh, President Grillo. Thank you very much for being here. But we have Council Member Rose, then, then uh, Council Member, then Chair Traeger. And that'll be it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chairs. Um, and good afternoon. Uh, I, I just wanna say um, along the lines of uh, Council Member Rodriguez, um, as you know, we've been fighting for universal after school um, for a while now, um, and we've been hammering the Youth Services uh, Committee, DYCD, for funding. Um, I would really like to see the Education Department also make it a priority where, um, where we have two agencies fighting to make this a reality as opposed to just putting all the weight on DYCD, especially since these are education programs. Um, I, I'm interested about, I, I, I want to say kudos about 3K and pre-K seats, but um, an issue that has come to my attention numerous times is 3K and pre-K seats for students with disabilities. So I'd like to know, you know, what are the number of seats that are currently available? Um, how many applicants have you gotten for um, pre-K and, and 3K seats for dis students with special abilities? And what is the wait list or what's the placement time for them to get? So, Council Member Rose, thank you very much. Um, this is a big issue for us as well. Uh, we've been working very closely with not only the State Education Department, uh, but internally around identifying the, the number and being very clear about what is the number, what is the anticipated number, and then how many of our students are on the wait list. Um, I'm asking my staff to get me the specific numbers that you've asked for in your question because it's, there's a lot of specificity in there. What I do want to say though is that we also see this as a priority. And as we've gotten and are getting better 
at processing requests for students with disabilities, uh, we are very quickly understanding that there's a greater number of seats. I know that we've opened a number of seats this year um, and we have plans for doing that as we go into next year, but we'll get you the specific numbers that you've asked for. Do you have any idea of what the wait time is? I, I can't say that I, can, no. I have an idea. I'm sorry. Okay, and um, I just got back from a tour around the harbor um, and with the Waterfront Management Advisory Board. And several of the stakeholders on that board are um, the Governor's Island School, the Seaport Museum, and the uh, Waterfront Alliance, and many others. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about um, on Staten Island, we, we fought really hard, and I want to thank the DOE for integrating um, marine extra, uh, electrical engineering into my CTE school because we found out that there are jobs that have gone begging. Um, so there was talk about us having a middle school or high school on Staten Island that was had um, specifically a maritime um, emphasis. Could you give me an update, um, Deputy Commission, um, yeah, Chancellor? Uh, Grillo, uh, on you know where that is because it seemed like it was more than a pipe dream. So, um, absolutely, you know that we. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, we had for a long time been searching on the in the areas uh, close to the waterfront, obviously, for sites for the Middle Harbor School. At this point in time. Um, we do not have a site identified. However, we, if you recall, recently we bought uh, the area called St. John's Villa, which is uh, right over the Verrazano Bridge, uh, very near the waterfront. We are looking at a master plan for that space. It's very, very large. Um, and again, we will work with the DOE to see what will be programmed for that particular area. Is that included in the five-year plan? Um, those seats have already been... This, our seats are always included in the capital plan where we see a seat need. However, the programming for those particular schools is really something we do in collaboration with the DOE. Okay, thank you. All right, I, th I think Councilmember Gibson just has a quick follow-up. Thank you so much, Chair Traeger. I love you even more. Thank you. So I just had a couple of questions, Chancellor, and President Grillo knows in my capacity, I chair the subcommittee on capital. Um, and so a lot of our work has revolved around the five-year capital plan, uh, multiple agencies looking at capital projections, not only in the five years, but over the next 10 years. So I understand there's uh, $10 million that's left over for school-based health centers. And Chancellor, when you talked about health and wellness, I mean, there's nothing more critical than school-based health centers and school nurses, whether they're DOE or DOHMH nurses, but I wanted to ask specifically about the remaining funding for school-based health centers and where we are. And then my second question is really around school nurses. Um, are all of our schools covered with a full-time nurse, whether it's DOE or DOHMH? And for those schools that we do have with a school-based health center, I understand usually that school nurse is now replaced by the nurse in the school-based health center, usually by a provider, which could typically be a hospital or a not-for-profit. Um, so, again, we'll get you more detail, but okay. my understanding is that not all schools have a full-time nurse, but all schools do have the support of a nurse. So, uh, again, one of those areas that's not, not where we all want to be, uh, a matter of funding and, and priorities. My under, uh, understand, understanding is also that you are correct in where we do have community-based health programs in the schools that the medical personnel um, take that responsibility and it allows the principal then to be creative in using that funding for uh, additional supports at that school. We are actually working really hard to make it so that every school will have a full-time nurse. They don't go anywhere else except that school. Right. We think it's critically important. Uh, unfortunately, I have to report, not all schools have a full-time nurse, but they have some some semblance of medical support. Okay. 
Yes, and, and council member, in terms of that uh, $10 million, uh, those projects have not yet been identified, but we work with DOHMH and DOE on uh, potential locations. And as you know, there needs to be a sponsor, um, hospital or the like to manage the school-based health center. Okay, so should we expect some sort of an RFP to come out or will that be continuous conversations with DOHMH? Uh, continuous conversations with DOHMH. Okay, um, and then in the five-year plan, there was a time when we were able to see the different funding breakdown between city, state, and federal um, and other funding streams, but that's no longer available to us. So I wanted to understand if the breakdown could be provided in future versions of any proposed uh, plan that we have with SCA. The, the funding in the five-year capital plan is primarily city funding. Okay, yeah. but no other sources? Okay. And then capital projects that the council members fund, um, we also were looking at future conversations in terms of identifying a mechanism by which the five-year capital plan and the database in which you use could also reflect council members' capital de designations as well, because I think for a lot of our constituents that are not familiar with uh, PB, participatory budgeting, or any other format, they really don't have an understanding of some of the capital uh, work that we're doing to complement the projects that SCA is funding as well. Understood. Um, we're happy to have that conversation with you and see what we can come up with. Okay, and then in addition, since we're still on the five-year capital, um, many of the efforts, as one example, if the capital plan is going to fund 1,000 bathrooms to be upgraded and 100 gymnasiums, we don't understand some of the obviously the logic behind getting to that number, but also the larger policy that could come behind that. So if we're looking to create a five-year plan and we want to replace all the bathrooms, we know it'll be much more than 1,000. So I guess what we're asking as a council is if we can have a conversation with you and SCA as we move towards these targets, we can actually have a policy that's driving that particular target and not just a number that we don't know how we got to that number. Does that make sense? Absolutely. We're happy to continue that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have, of course, lots of more questions, but obviously we will continue to work with you through the budget process. There is a lot going on. And one thing as a council member that I will always do is speak up, compliment, and criticize on behalf of the Bronx and District 9. Uh, we've done amazing work in the Bronx, and I know all of you know that, and I want to continue to keep us moving forward. Um, our children deserve it so much and as I travel to schools and I look at some of the conditions some of the resources I am always happy to help but I can't foot the whole bill and I shouldn't have to foot the whole bill but the reality is is I want to make sure that our principals and educators see the work that's happening and understand that we're here to help them through a lot of the work that is happening all of the academic achievements all of the partnerships I was at a school last week in my district in district 9 and it was a partnership with the high school and we were building bookshelves amazing in the gym and each classroom is not going to have a bookshelf and little things like that really make a difference and I appreciate those partnerships because a lot of times our schools don't have all the support and bringing in the private sector local CBOs and other partnerships is really uh, an important part of this conversation so I look forward to this budget conversation that we'll be having over the next few weeks extended learning time breakfast in the classrooms and everything else we've talked about fair student funding I definitely hope and, and expect us to get a lot of these achievements in this adopted budget. So I thank you all, and thank you so much, Chair Traeger, for indulging me to speak before you. I thank you, and once again, thank you to the staff. Thank you, Councilman Rohn. Don't you worry. We're, we're, we're going to be very vocal, front and center, in budget negotiations on education matters. <laughs> uh, Chancellor, just to follow up on, on, on some items, uh, you mentioned earlier that um, you budget what you get, and that adding uh, social workers is a matter of money. Uh, did you uh, submit a, a new need request prior to prelim budget or prior to exec budget to OMB for more money for more social workers? I'm going to I'm going to go back and look at exactly what we submitted. And I, I I would appreciate that if you can get back to us on that. And just to if you could share anything with regards to what you submitted to OMB that you have not received a positive response from OMB about? 
Do you have anything to share at this time? I, I think on, in all of the areas that we've discussed today, there's a need that we've had ongoing conversations with. Um, I actually joke with my OMB um, colleagues in that, you know, the, the, the financial outlook seemed to be very robust, and then I got here, and uh, <laughs> not so much. So there, there, we would build upon uh, things that have been funded in a much more robust way if there were more resources at that budgeting time. So uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for additional resources that we can invest in, in our mutual um, areas of, of priority. Yeah, and, and just to equip you with uh, you know, the, the, these informational tidbits, there is a lot of money in the budget right now, Mr. Transfer. So feel free to submit a very robust list to OMB that this council will support you on 100% because if you want to respond to that. No, just to say thank you. Okay. Uh, Carter cases, just to kind of dig deeper a little bit on this. Uh, does DOE track the number of Carter cases by disability classification or instructional setting needs and if so, can you provide this breakdown in writing? And just to note, we asked this question at prelim, and the answers we got from DOE were very vague. For example, we were told that some of the common programs recommended are integrated co-teaching. I believe DOE schools provide integrated co-teaching, so why is that being contracted out? Thank you for that question. So we have um, been digging into our data on, on this topic, and uh, you know there are a lot of different data points along the way, and, but I think it is fair to say that um, our data shows that um, there are, are speech and language impairments that are predominantly associated in the, in the, are predominantly related to Carter case settlements, as long as other significant health impairments and other types of um, print-based language disabilities, learning disabilities, that are predominantly made up of the Carter cases, in addition to autism cases. And as we know, autism is um, unfortunately something that is growing in our communities, and so we see a lot of Carter cases that are, are related to um, children somewhere along that spectrum. Right, but I'm just trying to understand, I appreciate that answer, I'm trying to understand why would someone, why would a child be contracted out to, a, to the private market for an ICT class when we provide ICT classes in our school system? Yeah, I want to understand that too. So let me, let me get back to you because I need to ask that question as well. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. Um, I want to discuss um, school safety. Um, when will DOE and NYPD be releasing their updated MOU, which the department has promised is coming soon for years? It's going to happen before the start of this next school year. So we will start the new school year with uh, updated MOU, and that will happen very quickly. So before the start of the new school year, and that's a commitment from, commitment from Mr. Chancellor? That is my commitment. I, I, I do appreciate that, that this is the most clearest answer we've received I think ever, so I, I do want to, want because for years, even prior to your arrival, we've just been hearing. Um, I just want to list a couple of examples about what um, the Giuliani era MOU, uh, type of the impacts it has, and also coupled with the fact of the inadequate supports we have in our schools, what is happening to many of our kids. And these are real life cases that were actually brought to our attention by an outstanding organization called Advocates for Children. Um, I will not read the names of the students, obviously, just the initials, but JT, a seven-year-old student with a disability in Brooklyn, was handcuffed in school by school safety agents after school staff were, un were unable to support him. They sent him by EMS to a hospital without his parent. NP an eight-year-old student with a disability in Queens was handcuffed in school and then sent by EMS to a hospital. He became so traumatized by the incident that he has been afraid to attend school. He has been on home instruction for months while his parent searches for an appropriate school placement. MS, a 15-year-old student with a disability in the Bronx, 
was handcuffed and then arrested for behavior related to his disability that was unsupported and unnecessarily escalated by school staff and school safety agents. SH, a 10-year-old student with a disability in Queens, brushed a blunt scissor against another student in class. Four precinct officers appeared at the school to investigate. The precinct was about to file felony charges against the student, but advocates for children's staff successfully advocated for school safety division high-ups to intervene and get the precinct to refrain from bringing such charges. So while the city has invested in mental health awareness and support, there continues to be a large gap in access to direct mental health services and behavior supports for students who need help the most. What if any, what if any plan does the DOE have to expand direct mental health services and supports for students with significant mental health and behavioral challenges? So we, as I've spoken, are working um, very closely with the Commissioner of the Department of Health. We are looking at how we are able to um, synergize our funding streams so that we're amplifying the services that we have. Um, we've created the, the division under Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson where we're uh, consolidating and um, being very thoughtful about how we're training those individuals in our school system. Uh, we have had uh, a number of conversations around mental health services and the provision of mental health services to our students and our families and our schools in a direct way, um, especially around Thrive and how that is working in our school system. Um, so there are a number of things that we're doing to try to build capacity to make sure that what you just described never happens again in our schools. Absolutely unacceptable. Uh, so that is really the passion and um, the energy behind our efforts to really build a much broader, um, deeper bench to be able to meet the needs. Mr. Chancellor, I appreciate that. It just, I, I'll just flag for you that in my questioning to senior Thrive leaders or officials, first of all, I have not received answers to my litany of questions to them. Um, secondly, there was confusion in that panel that I questioned they were, they were not aware that there was a freeze on social workers and counselors in our schools. Third, they acknowledged on the record that the Thrive School Community Mental Health Consultants are not licensed or credentialed to provide direct services to our children, are basically a referral for services. So when folks use the word access, that's punting, that's punting it to me, Mr. Chancellor. That's not, no, we, the schools need direct services inside the school. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure the mental health consultants play some role, but quite frankly, if, if we're tight on resources, which I know we're not, I would redirect that towards direct services in schools with licensed social workers. I just want to fact also, Mr. Chancellor, a diverse group of stakeholders, including city agencies, unions, parents, students, and advocates, uh, the mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline recommended a, in a July 2016, again, prior to your arrival, just, just flagging for you, it recommended in a July 2016 report, it, it, it is the same mayor, so new chancellor, but same mayor, report how uh, the city should fill this gap um, on, with regards to lack of direct services for students. Um, a mental health continuum involving school partnerships with hospital-based mental health clinics and call-in centers to help students in crisis in school response teams that help students get direct mental health services. The city council's response to the prelim budget recommends this critical investment of at least $11 million per year to launch and sustain the mental health continuum in 100 high need schools. There is ready, there's a ready to go plan just wait, waiting to get off the ground. Um, will you and the mayor partner with the city council to find the funding for this mental health continuum? Happy to come to the table and discuss specifics. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. And many of the painful examples I mentioned earlier could have been prevented had such a structure been in place. Um, I want to just, uh, we have some SCA. President Grill, I haven't had a chance to uh, speak to you yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I want to just note um, a, a great member of your team who we deeply, deeply admire here in this council. Um, I, we read some news that uh, sh she will be heading uh, to the Department of Buildings to be the new commissioner, Melanie Oraka. And I want to just publicly commend Melanie 
she has done an, an outstanding job um, uh, at, at SCA. Her response time is impressive, and it is not always easy to impress Mr. Traeger, uh, but her, her response time is impressive. She gets answers, she gets to the bottom of things, she cuts red tape where necessary. So I just want to publicly, you know, thank, I don't know if she's not here, she might be watching, but I want to thank Melanie for, for her service, and I'm sure that you would agree that uh, you're losing a key member of your team. Council Member, you just reminded me why I will miss her greatly. She is extraordinarily talented, and she will do a terrific job at the Department of Buildings. Right, and, and as she's not, it's hard to replace people like Melanie, <laughs> but who will be the new Melanie Waraka? Ah, uh, this is going to be tough. It may take several people to be the new Melanie Loraca. So we're working on it. Right now. And so you're not concerned about any type of capacity issues to No, the, I will say this. Melanie is extraordinary and does a wonderful job. But I have a super team at SCA. And uh, Melanie joined us about five years ago. But we did exist before. <laughs> and we got work done. And so we will continue on. Okay. We, we just remember, we, we never want to turn into the parks department turning eight years to build a bathroom in a park. So that's a separate committee, separate hearing. Um, but we understand the new investment in the new, uh, in the next generation network in the executive budget is associated with maintenance for the capital investment and broadband being made in the, in the capital plan. Is there any maintenance or warranty included in the capital projects procured as part of the DOE's investment in technology infrastructure? And how does the maintenance warranty differ from that being funded in the executive budget? I'm going to turn this uh, over on the, on the technology piece to the deputy chancellor. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I, can you repeat I, I can your repeat question? It, sure. I'm, I'm not quite following. Sure, I'll say it very good. Yeah. We understand the new investment in the next generation network in the executive budget is associated with maintenance for the capital investments in broadband being made in the capital plan. Is any maintenance or warranty I included see. in the capital contracts procured as part of the DOE's investment in technology infrastructure? How does the maintenance warranty differ from that being funded in the executive budget? Yeah, so thank you, that, thank you. Um, so this is an important question. So uh, there are many components of the next generation network, but a big portion of that work have been replacing the circuits that are um, the sort of nodes uh, leading to the schools. And so it is, it is actually, um, you know, replacing and upgrading the circuits in those schools and then replacing the, um, the equipment in the schools. And so there are, it's not sort of the typical maintenance that you might get with, you know, if you sign up for a new phone. Um, we can follow up with the, the specifics um, associated with that, but the, the project is, um, you know, is, is replacing those circuits in the street. Okay. And yeah, I'll just yeah. add, <laughs> as we're puzzling through this, you can see, we, we also had to update some of our maintenance contracts um, because they weren't long enough, and I believe that's part of what we did in expense. But we have to get back to you with the specifics of the Oh, yes, if you're referring to the transition between the Verizon circuits and the, uh, yes. So there was a, we were switching over between two vendors. We moved off of Verizon circuits, thank you, Karen, <laughs> to um, Light Tower, which I believe actually has a different name now, um, but I'm going to just say Light Tower. Um, and so there was an expense component to continue the Verizon contract because, as you can imagine, with the number of schools in our system, the transition period to transfer over from one vendor to another took a little bit longer. And so there was a piece uh, that was expense funded for that transition um, where there was sort of a dual funded piece while we were in the transition year. We are done with that process now this year. And so next year, we do not need the funding to continue with the Verizon contract going forward. And we can share the specifics with you offline. I, I would appreciate that. And do you have numbers with you uh, how much the DOE spends annually on internet service provision in schools? I do not have that number with me, but we can provide it to you. I would greatly appreciate it, and quite frankly, I, I think it's high time for us to meet with these, whether it's Light Tower or New Tower or whatever tower, because a peeve of mine is continuously still visiting schools that have problems with getting onto internet. And I'm now hearing that schools are so desperate that in some cases they are purchasing throttle devices 
to make sure kids don't log on to internet in their schools so they could secure enough broadband to send emails to Tweed and back and forth. That's how bad it is in some of these schools. It, it's just, it's just it, this can't continue. So we need to hold whatever tower accountable and rise, yes. Um, I'm hearing uh, also, just to flag for you, we've heard that the DOE and Apple, the company Apple, are currently in a dispute that is resulting in Apple being unwilling to ship technology products to New York City schools. Schools are concerned that they will lose out on purchasing technology with expense dollars they had earmarked for this purpose. Can you provide an update on this situation? Uh, I'm happy to provide an update. So I, I would um, slightly disagree with the dispute language. We've been in the process of registering their contract. That contract was actually registered late last week. Um, schools have been ordering all along throughout the process of, of negotiating the registration with the controller's office, but happy to say that that contract has now been registered and they should be shipping out their uh, equipment to the schools that ordered um, and they should receive it by before June 30th. When was that contract registered? Uh, late last week, I don't know the exact day, Thursday that's, or Friday. That's when I was contacted by a number of schools, not just one, um, that what I'm hearing is that uh, the DOE was apparently late on payments to Apple and Apple said we're not going to ship our products to DOE schools until these issues are, are resolved. Is, is this news to you or? So as you know, we can't actually make a payment until the contract is registered. Um, we have been allowing schools to continue the ordering process. Unfortunately, Apple was not willing to work at risk. And so they now that we have a registered contract, we are making those payments to Apple and those um, pieces of equipment will be shipped to schools and they should be delivered uh, very soon. Right, it just, I, I flagging from this, so it's that it's, it's, it's now May. Um, wh when were they supposed to have these computers delivered? So orders have been placed throughout the spring, um, and as you may know, it may take, it take, takes a little while sometimes to get contracts registered. The good news is that it is registered, and those payments will be made, and that equipment will be shipped, and um, schools will receive their orders. They're, they're, um, they will get the equipment. So if there's any delays with schools, I can send them to your, to your office and make sure that they get their <laughs> computers. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Has the DOE filled the vacant chief information officer position, and if not, when do you expect? Interviews are happening now, and oh. that should happen very soon. Okay, and the last thing we'll flag here is teacher's choice. Now, this was something when uh, Mayor de Blasio was council member de Blasio, was a big, big supporter of. Um, Mr. Chancellor, this has sort of been uh, another peep of, for us in the council, again, prior to your arrival, but just flagging this for you as well, that Right now, Teacher's Choice is sort of at the mercy of discretionary funding in the City Council. It's about a $20 million investment we make on the Council side just to make sure that Teacher's Choice is in place. To me, I would rename it being a former teacher and under the, when I taught under the Boomer administration, it was down to $75 per teacher. We've increased it to now $250, which is, which is good. But the issue is the sustainability of, of Teacher's Choice um, and I call it actually like a economic and social isolation prevention program because if we did not ha have these critical resources, many of my students would not have day-to-day -day supplies in the classroom. My department when I used to teach would pull the money together just to make sure we, we bought enough supplies at Staples to get our kids all the supplies they needed because many of them did not come prepared for social economic reasons. And so every year, it becomes a budget dance tactic around teacher's choice. Are there any plans to finally, once and for all, baseline teacher's choice so it's just a part of our routine budget and it does not become a part of the budget dance between the council and the administration? So that particular program, along with a number of other, I would say, issues that, um, go to helping our teachers and helping our schools directly are all part of a discussion we're having internally about how we make that happen so that it's not subject to the budget budgetary process every year. Kind of the, um, the cost of doing business, if you will, right? We, we wouldn't think of not having uh, the electric bill as part of a school. So there are certain things, this is one of those things that we're looking at how we get, we get this baked into the budget. Okay, well, well, there'll be more budget negotiations around it because 
it, this should not be at the mercy of discretionary items. Th th this needs to be baselined. And we'll just close out by, by saying, also I want to flag, this is the last um, budget hearing for one of the most outstanding city council central staffers that I have ever, ever had the honor of working with. Um, The, the city council's loss is NYU's gain. Uh, uh, she's going for her doctorate, and hopefully one day she will also help run this city as well. Uh, but she is an outstanding, outstanding financial analyst who, talk about the Melanie Oraka of, of the council, <laughs> who gets back to us in two seconds, and many of our sharply worded questions are, help, are crafted and, <laughs> By, by the outstanding staff, I, I want to give a big shout out to Caitlin O'Hagan. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. But don't worry, she's not leaving yet. <laughs> she starts I believe, in, in the fall. Yes. So we, we'll have her through budget negotiations. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, the numbers presented in the exec budget are not acceptable to the city council. There is money in the budget we will get more resources and money for our schools. That is a promise that we will make. And with that, this is officially adjourned.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Economic Development, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Paul Vallone. Um, it's just us here now. <laughs> oh, Councilmember Powers is here. Okay, great. I didn't see him there. We just heard from the DOE and SCA, and now, we'll, now we will hear from James Patchett, President and CEO of the Economic Development Corporation. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my colleague and co-chair, Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, everyone, for coming today to our hearing. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our President and the EDC staff for our detailed response to our questions in the preliminary budget hearing following uh, our first hearing. However, I am a little bit disappointed EDC took so long to respond to the questions that we had within. To ensure that our fiscal 2020 budget meets the goals the Council has set out, we need our active engagement uh, in the process and turning over the information. Agency responses provide us the critical information needed to set the content for the Council's preliminary budget response to the Office of, o Office of Management and Budget. Uh, as today, I'll need a quick turnaround from today's hearing and the proper negotiation so we can continue to have a uh, proper fiscal resolution. Today we'll be hearing from the New York Economic Development Corporation on their fiscal 2020 executive 10-year strategy, commit, commitment plan, capital budget, and the fiscal 2018 investment projects report. Some areas I'd like EDC to provide further information on include new projects in the pipeline, projects it manages for other agencies, contributions to the general fund and ferry expansion plans in order to help foster reciprocal dialogue with the committee members. Uh, we ask that you follow up with any of the council members due to the time limits today who are unable to complete their questions. In the preliminary budget response, the council called on the EDC to release a capital plan for NYC Ferry that provides information for all capital spending on barges, gangways, and ferry landings at the project level. All capital spending on landings should be disaggregated by budget line and the fiscal year. We're disappointed to find out that the Council's push for transparency in the presentation of the Executive Commitment Plan is still the same as it was in the preliminary plan. I would also ask that we continue conversations with other agencies that may have current um, plans at any marinas within the city. It is my hope that I have left ferry ready for future use. Case in point is the conversation we've been having about City Field Marina and other projects that are undergoing capital projects through the Parks Department so that we can leave those uh, marinas ready for future use. It is essential that the budget that we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and interests of the Council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of that process, and I expect NYC EDC will be responsive to our questions and the Council members. I'd like to once again thank James Patchett for coming today and preparing his testimony. I'd like to thank NYC EDC staff who have consistently been responsive uh, to our ongoing quests. We would not be able to analyze the city's budget at such a detailed level without your cooperation, so once again, thank you. I'd also like to thank my staff and the staff of the Finance Division for the help in preparing for this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask counsel to swear in the panel. Do you firmly your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairs Vallone and Drum, and members of the Economic Development and Finance Committees. My name is James Patchett, and I am the President and CEO of New York City Economic Development Corporation. I am pleased to testify you before you to discuss funding in EDC's budget and provide updates on some of our most impactful projects. I am joined today by my colleagues Kim Bakari, our Chief Financial Officer, and Lydia D Downing, our Senior Vice President for Government and Community Relations. For the FY20 Executive Budget, the Administration has allocated money for the following EDC-led projects. $180 million to further the Long Island City Investment Strategy, which outlines a plan for several city agencies to bring open space, infrastructure, street improvements, and a new school to Long Island City, the fastest growing neighborhood in the five boroughs. $136 million to revitalize aging park infrastructure to ensure Battery Park is protected from future floods caused by climate change. And $105 million to make waterfront improvements necessary to keep city-owned property in a state of good repair. We also received $29 million to make improvements to our over 66 million square feet of assets. We look forward to engaging the Council as these projects continue to advance. Projects like these are pivotal to keep New York's economy thriving, and today data shows that the city's economy is as strong and as diverse as it's ever been. Between March of 2018 and March of 2019, the city created roughly, roughly 80,000 jobs. We are now home to 4.6 million jobs, a record high. 
and average weekly wages were up too, by nearly 1.8% from the inflation-adjusted average the year before. But unfortunately, not all the latest economic data have been positive. Right now, just over 15% of jobs in the New York metro area are classified as opportunity employment, or jobs that are accessible to workers without a bachelor's degree. This is the second lowest percentage of any metro area in the U.S. behind, uh, just ahead of Washington, D.C. Moreover, from 2012 to 2015, real GDP growth was relatively slow in the New York metro area compared to other high output counties nationwide. Santa Clara County, in the heart of Silicon Valley, had an annual growth rate of 9.2%. Denver, Colorado's capital, is currently undergoing a renaissance and had an annual growth rate of 4.8%. In contrast, New York County's growth rate was 1.1%, just behind Middlesex County in New Jersey. This makes it clear <laughs> that if the city doesn't continue to make investments in our economy, trouble could be on the horizon. That's why today I would like to explain the steps EDC is taking to keep New York's economy among the strongest in the world, one that is inclusive, resilient to setbacks, and growing on a consistently upward trend. To do this, we are working to strengthen neighborhoods and improve lives across the five boroughs through strategic investments and targeted initiatives, programs, and developments. While many New Yorkers know that we are the organization that brought NYC Ferry to life, revitalized the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and kicked off the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project, we have hundreds of transformative projects that were born out of partnerships with local communities. Here's a snapshot of our work and how we are better preparing the city for the future. In Queens, EDC is delivering over 220 homes in downtown Far Rockaway less than two years after the neighborhood's rezoning was approved. 100% of these units will be affordable. The development will also include 20,000 square feet of commercial space and 7,000 square feet of community facility space. This investment shows we are making good on our promise to downtown Far Rockaway to improve the lives of residents and bring new opportunities to a neighborhood that has long experienced disinvestment. On Staten Island, EDC is helping ensure that Charleston, a part of the borough that currently does not have a public library, finally gets one. We are managing the design and construction of a 10,000 square foot library that will include community space with after hour access, a children's room, and a teen's room. We look forward to welcoming hundreds of neighboring ch neighborhood children into the first-rate space and helping to foster a lifelong love of reading. In Manhattan, EDC just opened the new Essex Market at Essex Crossing. EDC led the relocation and revitalization of the original market into a new 37,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility that is triple the size of the previous location. The neighborhood is a bastion of diversity and is reflected in this market. Amanova's Barbershop is run by an Uzbek immigrant Ni Japanese Delicacies is owned by a native of Japan, and Davidovich Bakery's bagels are made with a Ukrainian recipe passed down for generations. We are proud that all 21 vendors that operated in the old market will move to the new location, ensuring that we keep its special character. In Brooklyn, EDC is supporting 21st century manufacturing in New York City through the FutureWorks makerspace at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. This is a membership-based workshop that houses equipment, including a water jet, laser cutters, 3D printers, and metal shop, among other amenities. FutureWorks Makerspace allows aspiring entrepreneurs, small businesses, and hobbyists to use these tools without incurring the cost of purchasing them themselves, leveling the playing field for local residents interested in this industry. And in the Bronx, EDC is working to bring the Universal Hip Hop Museum to life. This new cultural attraction, the first of its kind in the city, will occupy 50,000 square feet and pay homage to local legends. The Universal Hip Hop Museum will be part of Bronx Point, the new mixed-use development that will include affordable housing, retail space, and a community facility. In addition to bringing this institution to life, we are also bringing arts education programming to Hunts Point, infusing even more culture into the complex. Every one of these projects will have an outside impact on our city's long-term economic success. By looking at neighborhood needs block by block, EDC works to ensure communities across the boroughs get their fair share of investment and everyone can contribute to and benefit from our collective success. We also have a number of citywide economic development projects that are meant to level the opportunity playing field. One of these is LifeSci NYC Internship Program, born out of LifeSci NYC, which is a 10-year, $500 million initiative in New York's life sciences industry. The internship program is designed to develop and ready the city's next generation of biotech leaders. This is especially important as the city's investment is projected to create roughly 16,000 industry jobs. Most importantly, the program is designed to reflect the diversity of the five boroughs and ensure dedicated students have an entry point into the field, regardless of their background. 
To guarantee this happened, we traveled over to over 50 college and university campuses across the city to encourage local students pursuing careers in science to apply. One of the students we met in our outreach was Sarah Marie Settori, who was in the last year of her master's degree in chemistry at St. John's University. Walking into St. John's biannual career fair, Sarah Marie thought that most jobs available to ke chemists were outside of New York City and that the likelihood of her finding a job was slim. But then she spoke to one of our representatives who convinced her to apply for an internship in Kinos, a startup that has developed new technology to disinfect medical facilities and ensure patients can be treated in the safest environment possible. Sarah, me Sarah Marie applied and was offered the opportunity and the rest is history. She is now the lead scientist of the company and is thrilled she's able to work as a scientist in a humanitarian field here in New York City. We want to help more New Yorkers like Sarah Marie reach their potential through our programs and career pipelines. That is why we have made investments in a range of workforce development programs, from the Tech Talent Pipeline to our Workforce Center at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, that have proven to be life-changing for many. Of the thousands of investments EDC makes every year, investments in New Yorkers are unquestionably the most meaningful. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate you coming in and giving testimony. Uh, I do have some questions on the citywide ferry service. In our budget response, the council called on EDC to provide a comprehensive budget and performance report for the New York City ferry with each financial plan. The council also called on EDC to release a capital plan for New York City ferry that provides greater and clearer details on how the ferry system is being funded. But despite the council's call for transparency, the executive capital commitment plan did not provide any additional information as requested by the council. So um, why, won't the ED why won't EDC provide transparent reporting to us on the funding, on the ferry spending? I'm happy to provide what, whatever information you'd like that we have available. I mean, I can give you, I think in our response, we provided a landing by landing cost. Uh, I think what you may be talking about is the way it's reflected in the city's budget, um, over which, you know, that's not, not, not up to us. That's OMB and the city who determines what goes in the city's budget. But in terms of our reporting to the council, we're happy to provide whatever details you'd like. I have here a landing by landing cost of how much it costs to build each of the individual landings. Uh, it adds up to about $91 million. Uh, and it's broken down, again, individually by landing. We also have a per vessel cost that we're happy to share with the council. Um, so wh whatever specific information we have, we're more than happy to provide. So I think one of the things that we're interested in is um, how much is being spent uh, per passenger to, to subsidize the routes. Mm -hmm. um, according to a recent Citizens Budget Commission report, the city is spending $10.73 per passenger. Uh, the report indicated that the future route to Coney Island may require a subsidy of over $24 per passenger. Why is the subsidy um, so high for that? And can the city do, uh, what can the city do to reduce the cost of the subsidy? So I, I, you know, I, I certainly understand the concerns. The, what, the, what the CBC budget looked at was a single year, um, and they did take the operating cost for that year and divide it by the ridership. Uh, that being said, the way that the contract was structured was that it was a fixed annual payment per year, baseline annual payment, uh, and that included the years in which the system was not fully up and running. So the year that the Citizen Budget Commission looked at was a year in which we were only operating four of the six lines, but we were paying the same fixed annual payment. So it's certainly true that the number was higher on a per passenger basis that year, um, but once we are fully up and operational, uh, we expect to have an average subsidy per rider of between $7 and $8. Uh, our initial projections were $6.60 per rider, which we've talked about from the very outset, but that was before the additions of Coney Island, Staten Island, and Throgs Neck, uh, which we think are important additions to the system. And there's no question that as you add additional routes, you know, it is slightly more expensive per rider, so that drives it up a little bit from the initial $6.60 to this between $7 and $8. So what, why is it so expensive for Coney Island, for example, up, up to 24 or more dollars per passenger? Right. So, I mean, Coney Island is, uh, is quite far away, I mean, candidly, uh, and that's it's actually out there. Further than the Rockaways? Was that? No, it's not farther than the Rockaways. It's, it's similar, it's actually slightly closer than the Rockaways. They're both, 
um, fairly expensive per rider, but I think what, what we certainly see is that the folks who have the least transit options are the ones who are farthest away from the center of the city, and we just don't accept the fact that they're far away uh, should mean that they don't have access to quality transit options. And the reality is, as we seek to reach more and more parts of the city, whether by ferries or buses or other forms of transit, it's going to be more expensive. You know, express buses cost uh, you know, a very similar amount per rider, and that's because uh, they're traveling from a very long distance. So people are paying once, but they're traveling for much longer. So the cost per uh, per rider is just higher. Are you saying that the um, the cost for uh, express bus service is close to the Coney Island figure or the ten dollar figure? I'm saying it's close to the average for the system, and the uh, the express bus average across all of the system is similar to the express bus, or is similar to the cost for the ferry system in the aggregate per what's, rider. What's that average? It's in the vicinity of seven dollars, similar to our number. Uh, what's the breakdown um, between the revenue streams uh, from fares to concessions to city subsidies? The break. Sorry, can you say it again? I apologize. Sure. What is the breakdown between the revenue streams from fares to concessions to city subsidies? Sure. Um, so uh, our, um, our our net uh, so net of uh, fares and uh, concessions, our total operations in FY18 were about $45 million. We're expecting fiscal 19 to be about $53 million. Um, so in total, uh, we get about $15 million in revenue per year uh, and uh, from, from fares and, and a very nominal amount for concessions. Okay. Um, how many New Yorkers are being served by the ferry service? Um, so in the aggregate to date, we've served uh, close to 9 million riders, and we are projecting that by 2023, we'll be serving approximately 11 million per year. And can you break that down by uh, routes? Um, I, can't, I can't right now, but I certainly have that data. Okay. I may have it in my notes. Okay, so maybe you can get that to us. And, and Happy to follow up, yes. And before I was talking about the ongoing reporting for each financial plan, uh, that's what we were looking for from, uh, from you. The which? Ongoing reporting for each financial plan moving okay. forward. Okay. Um, does EDC solicit community input on new potential ferry landing sites? And how do you vet proposed sites? Absolutely. We did a comprehensive community outreach effort as a part of the recent expansion study that we did. We did uh, meetings in, in with uh, convened by the borough presidents in, in every borough. Uh, we got proposals from uh, every solicited proposals from every community board across the city. We put out an individual survey that people could submit ideas from across the city. We ultimately evaluated over 30 potential locations. Uh, and we did a comprehensive analysis of each of those. Uh, our, my team is out in the field all the time. We've been out, we're, as part of the Coney Island launch, we have been out in Coney Island on a regular basis and in the evenings meeting with the community to talk about the specific location of the landing uh, as, upon the time it's implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, in 2015, EDC committed to doing a comprehensive and holistic reform of the entire suite of city-run commercial uh, incentives. At the time, EDC reported that this reform exercise was already underway and was targeted for completion for the 2016 state legislative session. Does EDC believe that the city has a responsibility to review its economic development tax expenditure programs to assess efficacy, efficiency, and re relevance, even if the city then has to go to the state um, to have recommended changes made? Yeah, I, I, I believe it's our collective effort, the city, um, and also I know the council is interested in this, and we've worked together on this in the past to uh, look at how the programs can be modified. Uh, I know it's an active conversation in, in Albany right now, um, and you know, we have certainly sought reforms in the past, uh, in previous years, that have not been made. What is this current status of the 2015 report? Uh, I can't speak about the 2015 report, but what I can tell you um, is that, you know, the, certainly there is an active engagement uh, in the current legislative session uh, about 
what changes might be made. Okay, the council passed Local Law 18 of 2017, which mandates annual evaluations of city economic development tax expenditure programs by IBO. Some programs subject to review would require information from EDC, and the law requires EDC to share requested information with IBO. It is the council's understanding that EDC and IBO are in the process of negotiating an MOU that would both protect the privacy of EDC's clients and permit IBO sufficient information to conduct the mandated uh, re review. What is the current status of the MOU, and is there uh, anything holding up the finalization of the document? Uh, I, I don't, uh, to my understanding, I, I, this, the MOU conversation predated my time at EDC. I don't believe that there was a conclusion around that. However, uh, it doesn't preclude IBO from advancing their audits that they're authorized to do under the law that was passed by the council. So we will share with them any and all information uh, in practicality that's regardless of the MOU. And we're not actively pursuing it, but we will participate and provide whatever data we can to IBO as a part of any analysis that they want to undertake. So you're committing to um, an agreement with uh, IBO on the MOU? No, I'm, I'm saying we don't need an, I, I don't believe we feel that we actually need an MOU. They, they are, they have a, 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 under the law that the council passed, they have the right to perform audits and we will provide the information to them uh, that they need for those audits. So you are discussing that with IBO? Right now, the MOU? No, and there's, there's no current conversation about MOU. We don't believe that, an, I don't know that IBO believes an MOU is necessary at this point. We just, they have the right to engage in audits without an MOU, and that's, as far as we're concerned, how they're going about it today. It's not necessary. They have a legal right to do it. We don't need an MOU in order for them to perform that. At the preliminary budget hearing, EDC testified that it would increase payments to the city by $30 million in fiscal 2020. In its response, the council called on EDC to increase its payments by an additional $10 million for a total contribution of $40 million in fiscal 19, but this was not reflected in the executive budget. How did EDC arrive at the $30 million figure for fiscal 19? For, for fiscal 20? Uh, oh, anyway, Wait, yeah. so yeah, so that was, I think that you're referring to the PEG plan that the, the mayor put out. Every agency in, uh, was given a target uh, for ways to contribute to the overall city needs. Um, you know, we're not actually an agency, but regardless, OMB gave us a target of $30 million. I cannot speak to how those numbers were set, but we uh, committed to meeting it, and we're still committed to meeting it. What impact would contributing an additional $10 million have on EDC's operations? I mean, I haven't evaluated it, but certainly, you know, $10 million in programming in all likelihood, it, one, of, one of our efforts, whether it was uh, workforce development programming at one of our industrial centers or, you know, neighborhood planning or impacts on the ferry service, it really depends. We haven't looked at cutting an additional $10 million, so I don't have a specific plan for it right now. Uh, why has the contribution to the general fund declined over the past few years? For example, in fiscal 2014, the, con the contribution amount was $126 million. It then dropped by $30 million in fiscal 2015 and 16, resulting in a total contribution of approximately $96 million. For fiscal 2017 and 18, the amount dropped even further to $73 million. Can you offer some insight on that decline for us? Sure. Well, I think probably the most significant factor is we have I think in broad agreement with the council moved away from selling city property, which has been a large source of revenue for, uh, for the city to leasing it. So as opposed to there being one time large payments in purchasing of property, we're entering into long term leases, which guarantees long term public control of the assets. So I think it's the right policy outcome for the administration. I think the council would agree, but it means that as opposed to those one-time large upfront payments, you have smaller payments over time. In fiscal 2015, uh, EDC showed a net loss of 25 million. To what was this loss attributed? Uh, so we, we budgeted for a $25 million loss. Uh, we always budget conservatively. Um, we believe that we should be able to come in pretty close to even. Uh, but 
uh, it's just to be conservative was why we had that number. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fiscal 2018, EDC has a net income of 14 million. How is this funding utilized? So uh, I think you know we're a not-for-profit. So to the extent that there is net income, we uh, use it to invest in future programs. It's what allows us to budget in future years for a potential loss. Uh, so in the event that we do have a loss, or else we have a recession, uh, we also have a uh, we also have a balance of cash available that we keep to deal with those circumstances. It's just good financial planning to make sure that you have cash. Um, an another significant advantage of that is that because EDC has cash on our balance sheet, it allows us to advance capital construction projects more quickly because we can outlay funds uh, prior to completing the full process, which allows us to get capital construction projects in many communities underway more quickly. I know in your uh, previous answer to one of my questions, um, you mentioned revenue sources, but um, what are the revenue sources EDC uses to fund its contributions back to the city? Uh, there's a few major sources, but primarily land sales uh, is, is one of the major factors. Another one is lease payments. Uh, we have a, both a maritime and a master contract with the city, and all of those payments, the specific payment requirements are dictated uh, in there as they have been for some time. Okay, the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes 3.1 million in fiscal 20 uh, through 23 in baseline funding for the graffiti fee, for the graffiti free and clean New York City program. This program, which was initiated in 1999, provi provides graffiti removal services and pressure washing of highly trafficked sidewalks in the city's commercial corridors. How does the graffiti free New York City determine cleaning schedules and routes? And will these schedules and routes be expanded in 2020? And I'm asking this a little bit selfishly because we have a big graffiti problem in Corona and um, Jackson Heights, Elmhurst area yeah. due to gang activity. And, um, and we really need help with that. I asked the PD about this as well. So can you just shine a little light on that for me? Absolutely. It's actually primarily through interactions with council members and through 311 complaints that we respond to graffiti removal. Uh, we certainly have primarily, we've historically targeted a lot of commercial corridors that have been a, a focal point of uh, graffiti that we have seen. We need to get the consent of the business owner uh, to remove the graffiti because in some cases uh, it's, it's art so you have to be careful, but if there is an interest in your community that you have a particular target area, um, provide us, uh, and we should follow up about it directly because we can have a team out there within the next couple of weeks uh, to meet with your office and identify locations that need to be addressed. Sometimes the business owners are afraid that if they take it down, particularly if it's gang related, that there could be revenge from the gang. Um, mm. Do you know how that's dealt with at all? Um, of course, we've actually had businesses turn us down I, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not an expert in that. I don't want to presume to be, but we'd be happy to work with you and PD to come up with the yeah, best way to approach Yeah, I think when, the, when PD finally went there, then I think they felt better about it, but um, initially they were, not, they were hesitant to remove it. Yeah. We, had, we had a similar issue with the post office, not because of fear, but because it's a federal building and we couldn't get the permission there. Yeah, well, we're, we're prepared to do the work regardless. Uh, you know, we're obviously not concerned about that, but we obviously need to be sensitive concerns about business owners' own safety, and uh, we don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Chair Vallone for further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, we've been joined by Council Members, our Majority Leader, Gory Cumbo was here. We've been joined by Council Members Carlina Rivera, Carlos Menchaca, Mark Jonai, and Peter Koo. Uh, and we'll take the questions from the council members after uh, this round of questions. And I just want to start off, I, I, I kind of like to break it down into a little bit of different areas because we have a unique situation with your budget and compare the, the size, the scope, the, the, the different boroughs, mm -hmm. revenue, capital, all of that. So in the big picture, I guess in the, the executive budget, um, EDC had a 10-year capital strategy and you provided $3.9 in fiscal 2020 to 2029. So that's our upcoming um, decade, which 269 million of that is larger than the preliminary 10 year strategy of 3.7 billion. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on the expansion of the original uh, 10 year capital to where we are now. 
Sure. So it is it is in the areas that I highlighted in my testimony. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, the, <clears throat> the funding for the 180 million, the 136, and the 100, the three groups. Yeah, that not all of it's our budget is unusual. Not all of that necessarily shows up in our budget. So some of the funding for the Lyon City efforts are in agency budgets. Um, uh, the, the the money for all of the waterfront improvements, which is the 105 million dollars, that's all in our budget. And the 29 million dollars to make improvements to our assets, that is all in our budget. How would we find, I guess, some of those interagency budget? items, because there's so many of the projects EDC works with is through cooperation with other the agencies. How is that reflected in this budget? Um, <clears throat> uh, so they, you know, they show up in other budgets. I think it would be, it would be, we'd be happy to summarize the specific line items of, of the, the ones I highlighted, which are the major ones, where they, sh where exactly what line items they show up in and whose budget, because again, sometimes it varies. It's not uncommon, I think as you alluded to previously, to, for, EDC to be performing capital work, for instance, on behalf of the Parks Department, and the funding is frequently in the Parks Department's budget, but EDC is doing the work. <coughs> is that the, reflected in the Parks yes. budget, or is that reflected in EDC? Or? That would be reflected in the Parks budget. So if EDC is doing work for a Parks capital improvement project, it'll only be reflected in the Parks That's budget? That's correct. How is there any interagency um, auditing of the project, cooperation on the project, timeline of the project? How is that handled? Oh, absolutely. There's an extensive amount of work. I mean, effectively, when we're doing this for the Parks Department, I take it as an example, um, you know, we basically view the Parks Department as the client. So they are, they have a project that they're designing, they have a certain amount of budget set aside for it, and we, we identify contractors, we help them work through a design process that can meet their budget, we value engineer it if it's necessary, and then we, <clears throat> we bid it out we hire contractors, we lower the bids, um, level the bids to get the best possible outcome, and then we proceed with construction and manage it ourselves while keeping Parks Department, for example, regularly updated about the process. Well, how many, how many, par I'm just, since we're talking about parks, it was, how many projects would you determine, or when is EDC brought into a parts project that EDC would then take over or manage versus a typical parks capital project, which yeah. we're all very frustrated over, and like to see that timeline go a little faster. Right, so it's an important question. So I mean, I think if you just look at the scope of things, my capital construction group, which is focused on you know, build, <laughs> building out these large scale construction projects for other agencies, is just over 30 people. Um, compare that to the size of DDC or even the capital construction group at uh, a DOT or parks, it pales in comparison. So we have a pretty small, capacity of projects that we can actually take on. The way that, you know, we're set up under our, uh, our founding documents as well as our contracts with, uh, the, with the city to uh, perform projects that are focused on economic development efforts. So uh, where we are able to take on projects that have a direct nexus with economic development and primarily in neighborhoods where we're doing more comprehensive planning. So would the park be the location of the park be secondary to the overall goal. So if we're doing a waterfronts project and it happens to be a park along <coughs> one of the council members' districts included in that, then that park would be included in the waterfront development or to be individual on its own? Yeah, I think the, the way that we think about it, again, is if it's a, um, you know, like just again, take the example of uh, <coughs> downtown Far Rockaway. So in that neighborhood, uh, EDC undertook, uh, undertook a comprehensive rezoning uh, in partnership with Councilmember Richards. Um, since we're doing a comprehensive plan for that neighborhood, which includes housing, uh, commercial space, uh, and uh, you know, new investments in infrastructure, we're taking on some infrastructure responsibilities as a part of that effort. Similarly, as a part of the inward uh, planning effort. So when we're involved in a comprehensive effort uh, for a community, uh, there's a direct economic development component we're able to participate in capital construction projects. So the scope of the project, would it be calculated through EDC or then through the community involvement of that project or the revitalization of that neighborhood? Um, a lot of the council members would, from day one, have always asked for the inclusion of that and the, the determination of the pipeline of projects and how those projects are determined yeah. in order for EDC to reflect this year and going forward. 
Uh, I think a big part of that, whether it's parks or DOT or SEA, yeah. um, is, is inclusion of the council members of districts and how those projects are determined. Uh -huh. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think we certainly are prepared. We want to work with the council members about identifying the priority projects for them. Obviously, we, as I said, we have a relatively limited staff. We can't do, you know, we're not DDC. Um, they, they, they're responsible for most capital construction projects, but we'd be happy to work on projects that have a, have a nexus with economic development and are priorities of yours. Well, I, I think we could use an example in your testimony, the $105 million to make the waterfront improvements. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, uh, my district is not exclusive of anyone <coughs> else's, but there is a huge amount of waterfront yeah. along the city. So $105 million is clearly not going to be enough to address what we want to do. But I would think this would be almost uh, an initial step in the right direction. How do we expand? How do we bring this to outer boroughs? Mm -hmm. How do we go beyond lower Manhattan with a project such as this? Right, so, so the funding that's in the budget so <clears throat> is really a reflection of EDC's historic, historic role where we manage much of the city's waterfront. Um, not all of it, but certain parts of it. Uh, certainly Parks Department and DOT manage other components of it. Um, <clears throat> but as a result of you know, aging infrastructure uh, and uh, the impacts of waves and salt water, uh, many of the waterfront areas have been damaged significantly over time and piles that were driven decades ago need to be reinforced on a regular basis. So this funding is primarily targeted towards uh, ensuring that that waterfront infrastructure is safe. So we do a regular survey of all of the waterfronts across the city, not just our assets, but also uh, those own, that is those managed by DOT and parks. We take a look at the piles and where we identify places that are in serious need of repair, uh, we seek funding from the city to uh, address those repairs because we, you know, we recognize <coughs> climate change is happening. We recognize um, the fact that uh, infra infrastructure on the waterfront is just one of many needs for infrastructure and investments in state of good repair across the city. But we just want to make sure that we're not uh, we're not letting our waterfronts just collapse into the into the east. So rivers. when was the last time a survey was done we, of we, the state of our We did them annually. Annually? Annually. And where do we find the results of that? Um, I mean, we're happy to share them with you. Well, I would think that would be critical, especially yeah. as we're looking forward. Um, so it's, it's 100 to make improvements to our 66 million square feet of assets. So we're talking across the five boroughs. Mm -hmm. So what would be the next step then once we determine what needs to be done? Uh, well, so what we do, so we, so that's the 29 million is in reference to our, our uh, property as opposed to the waterfront assets. So EDC manages over 66 million square feet for the city. Um, and we do a comprehensive evaluation similarly of, of our assets and where we need to make investments. Uh, and we, you know, we make sure this is like repairing roofs that are leaking at our public markets. It is um, investing in our industrial campuses to make sure that, uh, you know, the, they're, that they're resilient and that they are, um, in <coughs> that, that they are uh, efficient from a green perspective, that we're, they're not leaking air out the windows. Those are the sorts of efforts we're undertaking. It's a big portfolio. Well, I think we found a topic for another day on mm -hmm. where we can expand this survey and also post Sandy the amount of uh, infrastructure damage that we took and how much federal and state did not touch certain areas like mm -hmm. co-ops yeah. and condos were exempted and I have uh, we have many areas where they're still struggling to to rebuild from that without mm -hmm. city or state funding and I, I think this is uh, critical especially if you're doing an annual survey of our waterfronts yeah. uh, let me just take a, a quick stab and then I'll turn over the we used to have our budgets combined with SBS, with our small business. Now that's separate. But a portion of SBS's fiscal executive budget is represented in EDC's budget, which has non-capital related expenses. The fiscal 2020 executive plan includes $5 million for fiscal 2020. For example, financial district and a seaport climate resilience mastery plan. This plan will develop long-term visions for lower Manhattan. Can you tell us more about these projects and a little bit about um, SBS's um, budget and your cooperation with EDC at this point. Right. So, <clears throat> so because we're not a city agency, we are a, a contractor effectively to SBS, a not-for-profit contractor to SBS um, through our both our, as I said, our master contract and our maritime contract. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that history that I 
I can't even provide all the background because it was literally 25 years ago. But what I can tell you is, or more, um, the, the, what, I, what I can tell you is, uh, <clears throat> as relates to the $5 million, that funding is specifically allocated uh, for evaluation of an area in Lower Manhattan between uh, the Brooklyn Bridge uh, <clears throat> and Battery Park. Uh, to take a look at what sort of comprehensive resilience efforts are necessary in order to prepare for the com combined risks of sea level rise and storm surge. What we've identified is that we definitively uh, need to build something to, uh, that goes out into the water to address the challenges of the, those combined challenges. Um, and we're undertaking a master planning effort with the community to identify uh, what the best approach to that is. Well, some of those have been green-lighted to go ahead. Some have been held off. Most of those communities, I think, especially ours included, are ones, especially when we talk about waterfront and ferry expansion, are ones who are, are crying for that expansion. I know Councilmember Joe and I successfully uh, brought that and we were trying to do the same thing because when you have deserts like ours in Northeast Queens and many parts of Queens without a subway system, um, ferry systems can be run better as, as Chair Drum has mentioned and we're looking, trying to find out until it's fully operational. You mentioned that it's not yet fully operational. When do you envision the ferry system to be fully operational? So we, we have our full original system built out at this point. We launched our sixth route. Um, Last summer, uh, we've now announced the addition of two new routes, one to Staten Island and uh, one, uh, sorry, one to Staten Island and one to Coney Island, and then we're adding additional stop in Throgs, Throgs Neck uh, as a part of the Soundview route. Uh, the, we anticipate launching, adding the Staten Island route next year uh, and the other two routes the year after. Is there beyond 2020, the next phase of what you envision the ferries to be? So we are prepared to do another evaluation um, above and beyond those study, above and beyond those locations. Uh, at this point, we're primarily focused on implementing those locations, and we just completed an expansion study earlier this year or last year. Um, and so we'll be focusing on uh, on the current expansion for now, but after that we are prepared to work with the council on what the fu a future phase might look like. Well, I think you, you did a successful work in reaching out to the boroughs. You came to Queens extensively and all the Queens delegation, <coughs> the borough president went over all of the sites. I think you have sites there that almost made the grade and, and a possibility, so I think we can, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on what the next site location can mm -hmm. be. I think it's a matter of getting it to work, allocating the funds, making certain sites, and that's why I brought up existing capital projects with parks and or I think City Field Marina is a perfect example because although it's not in any, uh, it's helping all of the districts around it um, where there's a capital project ongoing, but we can leave that ferry ready instead of going back and doing another capital project. That, that's my goal in leaving the communities along the waterfront ready for that next phase when it comes or not. Maybe we get partners that can work. We have. U.S. Open, we have City Field Marina, there's many partners throughout the city that can bring it, but I think that's a perfect site that can be left ready for that next expansion, and I'm hoping you can look at that. Makes sense. All right, I'd like to turn it back over to Chair Drum. Sure, that'd be a great way to get to a next game, right? Yes, it would. <laughs> um, before I turn it over to my colleagues, let me just ask, what, what tax expenditure programs are currently being discussed at the state level? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, a regular visitor to Albany, but I understand that there's a comprehensive there's a comprehensive conversation going on there about many different uh, many different uh, tax expenditure components, both in the city and uh, uh, across the entire state. So maybe we can talk about that later on. Sure. About what those specific programs are. Yeah, happy to. If, if you're not. A, willing to say here well it's not I just it's just uh, I'm not not that I'm not willing to say it's that it's uh, the you know our role is on policy uh, I'm just not directly and personally engaged in the conversations I understand there to be a lot of conversations happening in Albany um, 
Albany remains a mystery at times to me, candidly. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to questions from Councilmember Powers, followed by Ku. And we've also been joined by Councilmember Francisco Moyer and Brad Landers. I think we had Carlos Menchaca before, but just in case we didn't, want to make sure Carlos is here. Thank you, thank you to both chairs for uh, your questions. Um, I want to just follow up on you. You both talked about life sciences in your testimony, and I know that last year, early last year, the EDC had put out a request for proposals or information related to life sciences. Can you give us an update on where you are in terms of, you identified a few locations, if I recall. I think one was either in or across the street from my district, and mm -hmm. can you tell us the update on um, citing of facilities related to life sciences and where you are in, the, in terms of those uh, responses? Absolutely. So you're correct. We did put out an, an RFEI. Uh, it was a request for expressions of interest, not an RFP, which is the more formal procurement process. Um, and what we said at the time was we were going to, you know, look at the proposals that we had um, and then uh, evaluate whether or not to put, either to award under the RFEI or put out a new RFP. Uh, we remain in conversations with uh, respondents about the sites that we put out, and there were three sites, you're correct. One was in East Harlem. Uh, another one um, is, as you say, across the street from your district, um, in Council Rivera's district, and um, a th the third one was in Lyon City. Um, you know, I don't, we are making significant progress on other components of our life sciences program, uh, and uh, so I don't, we don't feel a, enormous amount of urgency to award necessarily under that, but we are in, you know, real conversations with people and, you know, would love to put together the right project, but, you know, it's city-owned property and we also had city funding on the, you know, available, so we want to make sure if we do award that it's a project we can all be proud of. Hey, can you tell us how you chose those three locations as your potential sites? Yeah, I think we just, we looked, so, you know, the, the, the most natural thing that we focused on was a connection to the existing medical corridor, which is on the east side and runs, you know, from from NYU all the way up to uh, Mount Sinai and, and beyond on the east side. Um, and so it's, it's long been our belief that the east side of Manhattan, um, as well as uh, Western Queens were the most logical location for an expansion of life sciences corridor, uh, and that still makes sense to us. So we identified the best sites that we had in those geographies. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And you know that area that I represent has the Alexandria there with the new third bill and third phase coming on NYU, Bellevue, VA, OEM. I mean, all it's a it's a great location for a life sciences center. We also have the Hunter College property that we're discussing that the city owns um, and is an area for redevelopment. And it just strikes me that that is a prime location to do a very mm -hmm. big project tied into other facilities there. And I'm wondering if the EDC has looked at that property as a potential location for life sciences or another use. Uh, the, the Hunter College site? Yes. Uh, we have certainly looked at it. Um, you know, we, we do believe it has potential as a life sciences location. It's obviously a very large site. Uh, and also the funding for relocating uh, the existing uses that Hunter has on there uh, has not been identified from the state yet. So to me, that is a pretty critical question to, to determine what we're going to do with that site. We, we can't determine life sciences or any other use until we know that the uses that are currently there and are critical are have a new home. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, and we're gonna have to keep everybody to their time limit because we have um, two very important meetings after this, I do. Uh, Councilmember Ku followed by Menchaca. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair Drum and uh, My question uh, to you, uh, uh, President James and uh, Patrick, yeah, hi, how are you? Yeah. Good to see you. Is, uh, of the six existing ferry valves and the two upcoming new valves, none of them uh, includes uh, North Eastern Queens. Uh, from where the number seven train ends is a transit desert where uh, commuters do not have a lot of options in public transportation. So are there future plans for expansion of services to northeastern Queens, for example, to Flushing, uh, for the constituents in Queens who need more transportation options. Right. No, it's, it's a very important question. Thank you, and good to see you too, Council Member. Uh, you know, as as Chair Valone was was mentioning uh, a few.
few minutes ago, we certainly recognize the value of the ferry service for communities all over the city, and certainly Northeast Queens is an area that we remain focused on, and certainly from our perspective, we would love to see an expansion to that neighborhood. We think uh, there is a need for tra additional transit service there. We share your your desire for that. Uh, you know, we were we did a comprehensive study, um, and we worked I know closely with your office and uh, you and the council member and the borough president had identified a, a, an ideal location. Um, and I think as, as the chair noted, Parks is undergoing a capital project there currently. Um, and so I think as a follow-up, we will uh, talk to Parks about if there's a way for us to, during the course of that capital construction project, make adjustments that would make it possible to add ferry system there in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, uh, Councilman Manchaka, followed by Joe and I, and then Lander. Thank you, Chairs, and hello, uh, President Patchett. It was great this weekend. I know you mentioned the FutureWorks space. I think it was mm -hmm. an incredible example of incredible work that EDC is doing on the ground to actually grow the presence of a space, a maker space. This is a company coming from Staten Island a very kind of on the ground, local feel uh, because of the leadership. And so I just wanna say kudos to you and your team for making that incredible successful. Uh, I, will, I will mention that we were able to use a plasma cutter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and if you know what a cl plasma cutter is, it, it, it exists in the Brooklyn Army Terminal, I, I guess in Staten Island as well. But it's an incredible thing what happens when you supercharge a high-pressured gas yeah. in an electric arc and and then, like butter, cut metal. Uh, and <laughs> we did fun. that, which is really, really fun. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question in my short time to really think about what is happening at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. If you can talk a little bit about the success there. I think so many jobs have been created because of the investment. And I, I think that it just proves that when you can push a level of commitment to engagement and uh, kind of leadership, which is what you're bringing and your team is bringing. You get really beautiful stuff. So if you can give us a little bit about Brooklyn Army Terminal and then go a little bit north to South Brooklyn Marine Terminal and talk a little bit about the contract. This has been something that I think in a lot of ways has been a, a, a multi-prong approach from community, the city council, the mayor's office. And if you can give us a sense about what's happening in SBMT, the contract, and, and we'll leave it there. And again, I wanna say thank you again for your incredible leadership in Sunset Park. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. You know, we have a great team, as you referenced, at Brooklyn Army Terminal on the ground um, who are doing great work. And it's because of a partnership with you and other members of the community that we've been so successful, absolutely. So we have about 4 million square feet at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and we have about 4,000 people working there. It's a great story. We've committed to making those you know, jobs uh, in our core industrial fields, uh, and I think that's it's been great. We love, we really love the industrial sector because it creates a pathway for accessible jobs. People who don't maybe tr have the traditional forms of education, pathways to middle class opportunities, um, and I think it is. It's been a great partnership in terms of activating the public space, making the full campus accessible to people, doing community programming and trainings at the Brooklyn Army Terminal the new uh, space that we had an opportunity to open this weekend, which is gonna be available to the community. I think it's it's all, you know, as part of our partnership, we're really proud of the recent $100 million investment um, that opened up a new a half a million square feet. Uh, that's, it's a great step, it's a, a thousand jobs right there. Um, I think we're thrilled and it's also an investment in a building that had obviously been disinvested in for decades. It's been a great partnership. You know, moving north to South Brooklyn uh, Marine Terminal, this is a great, uh, it's been a great partnership with you and the, uh, the Congress members and other uh, lo local electeds as well. Uh, you know, we really believe in the potential of this as a continued maritime waterfront facility for job creation. Uh, you'll be working closely with the, uh, the local union to make sure there are high quality jobs as well and uh, also trying to make sure we're creating connections and partnerships with the local community. We are on the verge of executing our contract there and we're hoping to see some real activity and jobs created uh, later this year. So we'll be in regular touch with you to keep you updated. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Joe Knife. Thank you, Chairs. Um, thank you, uh, President Patchett. 
In your own testimony, you point out that 15% of jobs in New York City, the metro area, classified as opportunity employment um, or jobs that are accessible by workers without a bachelor's degree, the second lowest percentage of any metro area in the U.S., just ahead of Washington, D.C. I bring up two projects. One, the Hutro metro, metro Center in the Bronx, which currently has thousands of employees with thousands of more visitors daily, and the infrastructure that it are needed for its continuing expansion. Mm -hmm. The second uh, project is the Whitestone Cinema, which has come to you and has had initial conversations about the IDA mm -hmm. component of it. This is a 1,400 estimated new jobs on top of the 1,000 construction jobs uh, fully equipped with solar roofing for 2.3 megawatts of electricity for uh, car charging stations. It's an urban warehouse, something that I would imagine we would be willing to embrace and support. Um, One million square feet of warehouse space on 15 acres. Mm -hmm. Where else can you find that in a major city? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if the conversations are ongoing, but I'm certain, certainly concerned about the viability of that project. The other is, of the 523 projects between, for the 10-year capital project, 2019 to 29, only 40, only uh, 48 have been in the Bronx. What are the dollar amounts associated with these projects? And I love to hear about the advancement of the other B borough, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. but I'm more concerned about the borough of the Bronx. Remember that yeah. borough? Yeah the one with the highest rate of poverty and mm -hmm. so many other um, yeah. underlying issues that require more support and more attention. Uh, my last question to you is the ferry expansion, um, a commitment for, from you as to when will the Ferry Point Park commence as well as a possible extension to Hunts Point, something that we've all been excited about it's adding an extra stop on a route. Um, I don't think it's going to create that much of an issue, but this will allow more frequenters to come into the Hunts Point Terminal, uh, as well as uh, enjoy the rest of the borough of the Bronx. Okay, I got a list. Okay, uh, so let's start with the Hutch Metro Center. We agree. It's a fantastic job center in the in the you know in the Bronx. Uh, we we, be, you know, we certainly believe that jobs in the medical profession um, it can be uh, a a significant opportunity for career advancement. And there's a there's a huge cluster of jobs in that area, as I know you well know, in, in the, the medical profession. Um, and we're really excited about the possibilities of working together on that. Uh, you know, we're also. Uh, you they know, asked, but I believe they asked you for, they've had conversations with you about a ramp. There's only one point of entry, mm -hmm. which well, this is, right, that's has a, created quite a log jam, if you can only imagine, for the mm -hmm. thousands that visit there daily. Yeah, so that, right, so that's a, that's a state project, I believe, but we're in, com we're in conversations with them and we'd be happy to be helpful. Um, I, I think the Whitestone Cinema Project, I mean, I think what you're, referring to there, you know, we certainly believe in the excitement of importance of freight jobs in the city. It's something we believe in, quality jobs. You know, I think the questions heard from other council members today and over the course of our um, conversation is how to balance the IDA program, which is a tax incentive, with the benefits that the public is getting. Um, and so certainly in the conversation around Whitestone, as well as in other discussions, we would want to make sure that we were getting something that would not happen otherwise, and that would really create job opportunities for local people. Uh, so that's the fundamental question about that, and I'm, I'm not familiar with the latest with them, but those would be the questions we would ask of any project. Um, and I'm sure everyone on the council would agree with that. Uh, uh, you know, I think, you know, you just asked about the Bronx in general. You know, I agree historically, uh, there has been a lot of focus, you know, obviously on economic development in Manhattan and recently Brooklyn. We have focused a lot on the Bronx. Uh, we've, you know, we've continuing to make significant investments in Hunts Point and council in, in partnership with the council member Salamanca um, uh, in the in the markets there. Uh, we are we just completed uh, a, an effort to rezone the lower concourse. We're bringing th a thousand units of housing and uh, also. 
uh, community facility space there, building out the adjacent parkland. Uh, we are uh, we're, we're working to um, uh, rebuild the the Orchard Street Pavilion or the Arch Orchard Orchard Beach Pavilion, uh, which which is a really important project I know for the borough and an epicenter of people where where people go from all over the borough to enjoy themselves. And we be, we certainly believe in the future of the Bronx and we want to continue to invest there. Um, you know, most recently we had the we went through the successful public approval process for Spofford to tear down the former juvenile detention center and build a, a job center as well as affordable housing. I mean, there's no project I could be prouder of in the entire city. Those are all great opportunities in the Bronx, and we'd be happy to do more. It's about economy. Housing is great. I'm glad yeah. that you're helping, but this is about job creation, permanent job creation. Mm -hmm. These are some major projects that could use the support for a borough that certainly needs it. If that's the statistic yeah. for the city, mm -hmm. I can assure you, in the borough of the Bronx, it's going to be a lot less than 15 percent. We could use the help, and I'm looking forward to partnering with you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, President. Thank, Thank you, you, Council Member General and Council Member Breadwinder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. President, we've uh, talked many times in the past about your work uh, doing capital projects management for other agencies. Yes. So I guess a couple of things. One, and we're working very hard in the Council this year to push forward with the administration on more capital projects management transparency. We've had good conversations with uh, OMB and separately with the Mayor's Office of Operations and separately with DDC. So there's a dialogue underway. It's not yet clear to me that there's enough coordination on the administration side about what that system should look like. Should the better tracking system sit in FMS? Should it be built off the thing the Mayor's Office of Operations is doing? Should it be built off the new software that DDC is developing? And I think what you said here is pretty interesting that the projects that you manage actually appear in the budget lines of the agencies they're on and not in yours. So some work will have to be done to make sure we know which agency is managing the project as well as who's paying for it if we really want to understand where it's being done well. So I guess if you could, one, just remind the members some of the reasons why agencies seek EDC as a capital projects manager. You have a good culture of management, but you also have some structural and legal advantages. Um, are you in some dialogue with any of those other agencies about improving both transparency and performance? Um, and, and what thoughts would you have about how we should do that in a way that really brings us, um, you know, some of the things I, that I think you have been able to do at EDC in capital projects management and push those out more broadly across the full range of the city's capital projects management system? Right. Thanks for the question. Good to see you. Um, so <clears throat> I think the, the two most significant factors that we have uh, that, that are our structural benefits um, that, we, that we employ that are successful in advancing capital projects more quickly are one, our approach to retainer contracts. So th that is where we, we solicit a series of, of construction managers who are pre-procured and then when we have individual construction projects um, we can do a solicitation within those, which allows us to significantly shorten the procurement process. We still, we still meet all of the legal obligations that were intended by procurement. We're still totally transparent about it, but it has the advantage of not having to start from scratch every time you do an individual project, but rather trying to say, this is the approach with, in which we do capital projects and getting people set up in the system and ready to go so that when we're, in, so when we're going after specific projects, we're we're not we're starting at the starting line, but we're significantly advanced. Um, the other thing that we have the advantage of doing um, is we have the ability, because of our financial situation, to start making payments under a contract before we have uh, necessarily unlocked all of the funds from the city, so we can begin design uh, before having a fully registered CP, which is uh, a huge advantage because of we obviously appreciate the process that we need to go through, which is really important with the city and uh, ensuring that uh, the budget is appropriately allocated. Um, but <clears throat> I think generally speaking, most of those conversations, there's no question as to whether or not the project is going forward. So our belief is we know we're going to need to do design for this project and we should start that now as opposed to having to wait to figure out the exact uh, I's dotted and T's crossed. So that's, those are the two major structural advantages. Um, to, to answer your first question. And the second question is about, you know, interagency coordination. You know, we have 
you know, as we talked about last time, uh, DDC did recently do uh, take a new approach or put out a new blueprint for how they would approach capital construction, and we did certainly talk to them about that process. Um, we're, we're not actively engaged in a conversation with other agencies about how to improve the process. We would be happy to, to do that. Uh, you know, as I said, <clears throat> we have some unique tools and we have, uh, we have a relatively small bench. So, <clears throat> you know, it's like ED, you know, certainly, uh, you know, it's not as though EDC could do all the capital construction projects, capital construction projects for the city. And I know that's not what you're suggesting, but we'd be happy to provide expertise and uh, guidance about what could potentially be done differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Moya, followed by Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum, uh, Chair Vallone, for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Thank you, uh, President Patchett, for uh, uh, your testimony here today. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, yesterday, we had another uh, construction worker die on a construction site. That brings it to about 70 now in the last two years. Uh, truly an epidemic of what uh, I see that is happening uh, in that industry here in the city of New York. Can you just uh, tell us uh, what are the steps that EDC is taking to uh, ensure that uh, projects uh, that are being done here with uh, capital dollars are using uh, reputable contractors uh, without a history of wage theft or uh, safety violations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really important question. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. So the you know, I know that the council recently passed some comp comprehensive reforms uh, on safety training, specifically across the city. Um, from our perspective, uh, you know, with, for, for, the, for the vast majority of our projects, um, are, we're working with union contractors who are uh, obviously very well trained and prepared to address safety issues. Um, and in particular, we go above and beyond that. Um, you know, we, we do a comprehensive background check for all of our, uh, for all contractors who are gonna be doing, doing construction work. That includes looking, looking at the issues that you identified. Um, and we are prepared to terminate our relationship with anyone who has, who doesn't live up to the standards that we expect. Thank you, but just uh, do we, why, why can't we have responsible contractor language now uh, on our RFPs that go out uh -huh. Um, given that we know who these uh, individuals are, the, who these contractors are, I think it's a no-brainer that the city uh, should not be doing business with anyone that has uh, uh, safety violations uh, and wage theft uh, that we consistently see. Uh, I know that you're doing what you can, yeah. but I think it's important that we uh, now take it to another level and just have that as part of what we do as a city going forward. Uh, I just think would solve our problem uh, more than just doing the extensive research on things because we know who they are already and I think that that would be an important step in truly uh, uh, making sure that uh, we are cleaning up this industry uh, where we're seeing so many uh, uh, construction workers uh, dying on these sites and uh, I just hope that we can work together uh, to make that a reality. Yeah, absolutely happy to work on it. Uh, yeah. Safe, the safety is a paramount concern, and one death on a construction site is certainly too many. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, first, I want to thank your team for working with our, my office and working with uh, the local stakeholders in the Hunts Point community on the Hunts Point Vision Plan. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, our continued work and ensuring that there's a lot happening in Hunts Point. You know, we have the Metro North, Spofford, um, the Fright NYC that may be coming. You have the markets, and um, there's, there's, there's other housing opportunities that are coming to our communities. And I want to ensure that, you know, all these projects are in one plan. They're not, we, mm -hmm. we're not working off of different projects where, other, where we don't know what's happening um, in, in these other projects. Um, but something that I, I've, I've kept a very close eye on is the um, the Vernon C. Bain Center, which is the, the, the barge, the jail that's in the uh, in the Huntsman community adjacent to the fish market. Um, and I've come out publicly asking that this administration close down the barge. Um, uh, you know, I know it's part of the mayor's uh, 
Pearl Base Jail plan, uh, but you know, closing down the barge, in reality, as part of his plan, this would happen uh, at the end of the process, which is 10 years, which I think is unacceptable. Um, so should the mayor uh, realize that he is going to shut down the barge while he is still mayor, um, there's been a lot of conversations about what can happen with that piece of land, and something that many businesses in the community has, uh, in, that, in that immediate area, have asked for is a ferry service in Hunts Point. Mm -hmm. Has EDC had any conversations or, you know, pre preliminary conversations about bringing in a ferry service to the Hunts Point community? So, I think, so I think, um, First off, I know you have been a significant advocate around this issue of the prison barge, and I certainly understand your concerns, obviously, out of my jurisdiction, but I, I certainly understand your advocacy, and I know your community appreciates it. Uh, from, from, our per, from our perspective, you know, we'd be always happy to take a look at additional locations. Um, as we were discussing earlier, we're currently in the process of expanding the ferry service. Uh, we, uh, we're looking at the possibility of expanding to um, potential f or to future locations in Staten Island, Coney Island, um, and also in Throgs Neck, uh, which is going to be that, that final expansion will be complete um, over the course of the next uh, <clears throat> approximately two years. And we will be engaged with the council absolutely at near the end of that process to look at potential future locations, and we'd be happy to look at Hunts Point as a possible location as well. All right. Now, my last question, um, the Spofford Project. Yes. Exciting project. Got rid of a juvenile detention center, building 740 units of 100% affordable housing, light manufacturing. But these, these projects, the Spofford Project, because of how big it is, it will be built in phases. Phase one just got, it's, it's going through its closing with HPD. <clears throat> Uh, but my concern is I have about 12 to 15 projects waiting on a pipeline for HPD to do the closing, and they've just pushed them all back to another six months. Mm -hmm. uh, but Spofford is, uh, they are closing the Spofford project and this closing for HPD. There are two other phases, and I am concerned that HPD may delay this project. Is EDC in conversations with HPD to ensure that there are no delays in these closings, these future closings? We share your priorities. Okay. We're in regular conversation with them. We want to see this project get completed. Uh, obviously, it, you know, HPD has to take a citywide lens, but there, there could not be a project that I'm prouder of to be a part of than Spofford. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with that, President Patchett, I want to thank you. Well, it's been joined by Council Member um, We're just about to close out the meeting. Robert, do you have any quick Question. All right. Uh, I just want to thank you for today. I know we have great teams helping us, which make us sound so good. Uh, I have Aliyah next to me, which makes me sound really good, so I'm thankful for that. And I want to turn over to our chair to close us out. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to this panel. Uh, this concludes our hearing for today. This finance committee will resume executive budget hearings at fiscal 2020 tomorrow, Tuesday, May 21st, 2019, at 10 a.m. in this room. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the libraries, the Department of Cultural Affairs, the Department of Sanitation, and the Metropolitan Transit Authority. As a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Thursday, May 23rd, the last day of budget hearings at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned.